Okay, let's begin with kind of a general overview of the UDK user interface. Think about this as the interface at a glance. Now, what you see in front of you is what you get when you first launch UDK. You get a little window with the tip of the day, and of course, if you don't want to wait till tomorrow, you can click on the next tip button and cycle through these. I highly recommend you take a moment and read through these when you get some time. There are some gems in here that you might not otherwise have known. For now, though, we'll go ahead and close that, which brings us to the start page. Now, the start page is full of all kinds of cool information about UDK, about its features. There are downloads that you can grab, such as uh, demonstration levels, entire games you can grab from here. Also, if you want to know anything about licensing, it's all available right here at the start page. Now, we'll come back to this window and some of the tabs associated with it toward the end of this video. For now, though, let's go ahead and close this out. And this will give us the UDK main interface. Now, if you're completely new to working with any kind of a 3D environment application, perhaps such as uh, Autodesk 3ds Max or Maya, then this might seem a little overwhelming at first. But don't worry, once you get into it, you'll find that UDK is very intuitive, very easy to use. So what I'd like to do here is just kind of walk you through the key areas of the interface just so that you can identify them and generally know what each part is used for. Dominating your view are these great big four panels. They just kind of take up all of the primary space. So let's start with them. These are your viewports. These allow you to see your level while you're editing it, as you add objects in, as you change textures, adjust lighting. This is how you see what it is you're doing. Now currently, it's a little bit hard to visualize that. So what I'd like to do is open up a level that's included with UDK so that we have kind of a point of reference, something we can look at here inside the viewports. So I'm going to go up to the file menu in the upper left corner of the screen, click file and come down to open. And I'm going to choose VCTF Sandstorm, one of the included maps with UDK and click the open button. Now this is the Sandstorm map from the game Unreal Tournament 3. It's completely playable. And we can edit it right here if we want to make our own versions of it. The reason I've opened it here is so that we can get a quick demonstration of what these viewports are for. Now, I'm not going to go into actually navigating the viewports. That's something we'll touch on later in another video. But you see that using this perspective viewport in the lower left corner, I can look around the world. I can see all of the little objects that are placed inside the map to actually turn it into a playable game. I can see all kinds of things that the game player generally doesn't see. Or if I want to, I can actually visualize the game exactly how the player might see it, including little effects like lens flares and whatnot. Also, if I really want to get an idea of how the game is developing, you know, if I've changed some things and I want to know how the player is going to experience those, I can test the game right here inside the viewport. So if I just click the play and viewport button, boom, I'm actually playing Unreal Tournament 3 right here inside the viewport. So here's flying around in a vehicle. And of course, shooting rockets, because it's important to be able to shoot rockets. So let's go ahead and hit escape and jump out of there. So this is what the viewports are all about, is seeing the actual environment that you're building, being able to get an idea of exactly what the player's going to see while they're actually playing your game, and to be able to edit things on the fly. Now, there are two different types of viewport you may have noticed. You have the really pretty one down here in the lower left-hand corner, which you know, has all the nice lighting effects and whatnot. You also have three other views surrounding this. These are your schematic views. Think of these like blueprints or elevation prints. They show you what the world looks like in wireframe, and we can change that and work with that information in a variety of different ways, which is something that we will talk about later on once we start focusing specifically on viewports. So in short, that's what these guys are. They're just ways to see your level. Now, each viewport, you might have noticed, has its very own toolbar. These are just a series of buttons that allow you to control the behavior of this viewport. If you want to change the way this information is being rendered to you, if you don't want to see it in this nice pretty lit form, you can change it to a variety of other settings. Like in this case, we're just looking at the lighting information. We're not looking at any textures at all. Or if we want, we can just look at the textures and not look at the lighting. And we'll talk uh, a lot more about these various modes a bit later on. Now, that's it for the viewports. That's really all I need you to know right now. It's kind of what they're there for and some of the uh, some of the things you can do with them. Now, from here, let's jump all the way to the top of the viewport. You're going to notice some things 
that are fairly standard in most applications. You have a standard menu bar with things that you might recognize, such as a file menu and an edit menu. We will be going into each one of these menus and giving you an idea of the kind of options you'll find in each one in specific videos over that. Underneath the main menu bar, you have the main toolbar. Now, the main toolbar is really here to give you quick button-based access to many of the frequently used commands that you'll be using a lot as you use the editor. Things like uh, creating a new level or clicking save if you want to save your current progress. Uh, you can open up a variety of different browsers to help you find assets to load into your level. And we'll talk more about that a bit later. But in short, really, it's just your most common functions for the editor are all found within some form of a button here along the main toolbar. But that's, of course, not all the buttons. You'll notice here on the left-hand side, another stack of buttons. This is your toolbox. Now the toolbox is here to allow you to put the editor into a few different modes. Now that sounds a little bit scary. It's like, oh, the, the editor has all these different modes. I mean, what is the, what can we do in these modes? You'll find that they're all pretty specific. If we want to uh, model geometry and actually do extrusions and move points around and reshape pieces of geometry, we have a geometry mode. If we want to shape the terrain of our levels, for example, if we take a look, we have this nice sandy ground plane. You know, if we want to maybe change that and carve a canyon into it, we have a terrain mode. Just some generalized modes that allow us to work in specific areas of our level. And that's something that we'll cover a bit more as we go forward. But there are other things too. Various objects and articles that we can add into our levels, such as simple primitives, cubes, cylinders, cones, and whatnot. We can add volumes. We can show and hide objects. It's almost like an extension of the main toolbar. Various functions you'll be using quite a bit as you create your own levels can be found over here inside the toolbox. Now, at the very bottom of your interface, there's one more line. This is the console bar. Console bar is where you're going to go to get a lot of information about what it is you're working on at the moment. For instance, if I select one of the objects here, let's just grab this dome. I'm just going to click on it. And as soon as I do, right in the middle of the console bar, it tells me that I have selected static mesh actor underscore 3002. So that is number 3002 of all of the various meshes that have been placed in this level. Just a way to tell you exactly what object you have selected, but other information will appear there as well. As you move objects around, it'll give you their location. As you rotate them, it'll feed back their rotation. All sorts of things you can find down here. There are, uh, there's an area next to this where we can type in the actual scale of an object. If we want to stretch it, make it bigger or smaller, we can do that by punching in numbers and a variety of checkboxes to control how we interact with objects. Would we like objects to snap to the grid for precision placement? Uh, do we want rotations to be snapped so that we don't get you know, really tiny degrees of rotation? We can snap it to, say, 15 degree increments if that's easier for us. At the far end, there's also a checkbox for autosave, which I turn off for the purposes of recording videos so that you guys don't see an autosave window pop up while I'm trying to talk to you. But uh, generally, I would recommend that you leave this on. Uh, the idea of autosave is that while you're working, it will stop for just a moment and save your progress so that in the unlikely event of a crash, you don't lose your work. So that's a quick rundown of the main interface. Now, just a review. The four big panels we have here are viewports. Each viewport has its own toolbar along its top. At the very top of the interface, we have the main menu bar. Down from here, we have the main toolbar, which is just a series of buttons that give us quick access to common commands. We have the toolbox, which allows us to change the mode of the editor, as well as a few other common commands that we'll be using as we rough out and block in our levels. Along the bottom, we have the console bar, which gives us important information about the objects that we're manipulating as well as the ability to control how they're manipulated. Are they snapping? Uh, is their rotation being controlled in any kind of a specific way? So there's your main interface. Now, that's not quite all. There are a few other parts of the interface that by default aren't visible, that you need to know just at least generally about and how to get to them. The first and probably the most important is the content browser. The content browser is where you're going to get any asset that you'd like to place in your level that was created from an outside source. Now, when I say that, if you're completely new to the world of game design, you might not know what I mean. But to help illustrate, let me just open up the content browser. There's two places we can do it from. One is here inside the main toolbar. There's an open content browser button. You'll notice it's got the little tiny U logo for Unreal on it. Or we can go under View, Browser Windows, and choose Content Browser. 
Now, in a nutshell, the content browser is here to give us quick and easy searchable access to exterior assets. These are things like textures that we would have created in Photoshop or 3D models that we would have created in 3ds Max or Maya or one of the the many other 3D animation packages out there. Uh, Things like sound effects, uh, things like particle systems, anything that we have to create through any kind of exterior means to place into our level can be accessed right here. And we'll talk specifically about the content browser and how it works, how you can navigate it in future videos as we move forward. Now, this window that contains the content browser has several different tabs, and I don't want to go into all of these tabs right now, but I will mention one very important tab, and that's the Actor Classes browser. This gives you access to any object that is integrated into the Unreal Engine 3 game engine. Uh, Things like uh, cameras, things like weapons, vehicles, ammunition, things that actually required some level of scripting to be integrated into the game can be placed right here. These are different than assets because they're not really the kind of thing that we would have created inside of, say, uh, Max or Maya, though they may have a 3D model, they may have a texture associated with them, and in most cases they will. These are things that required some level of programming to integrate into UDK. And so we're going to access them through the Actor Classes browser. And this is something that we'll be using a lot as we get deeper into creating our own worlds, as we need specialized objects, such as maybe a weapon pickup or a place to put a vehicle or even specific kinds of lights. All right, now that's everything that I want to cover in this very general walkthrough of the user interface. Of course, there are other parts of the UI that you will be getting in touch with, just to mention a few. We have things like the Cascade Particle Editor. We have things like the Matinee Animation Editing System. We even have Kismet, which is a visual scripting system. But these are all things that you'll be introduced as you kind of move further along. Right now, I just want to focus on these basic primary parts of the user user interface. So let's go ahead and move on from here and go into some specifics on each one of these parts and you can learn more about these key elements as we go. All right, in this video, I wanna go over the different types of viewports you have available here inside of UDK and we'll also look at some basic navigation to help you start to move around through your level. Now, currently, it's a little hard to tell what's going on because we have a blank scene. So let's go ahead and open up one of the levels that's included with UDK. I'll go up to the file menu and click open and let's pick on dmsanctuary.udk click open and wait for that to load in and we get one of the levels that is included with udk in all of its splendor and glory now this is the sanctuary map which is actually from the game unreal tournament 3 without touching anything though without even trying to move or, or play with the viewports at all we can see right off the bat that three of these viewports look very similar while the fourth one in the lower left hand corner looks a lot different Now, in the lower left corner, by default, is your perspective viewport. The other three views, being in the upper left-hand corner where we have the top view, the upper right where we have the side view, and the lower right where we have the front view, these are all orthographic views. Now, the key difference between the two, aside from the fact that the perspective view currently shows all of our lighting and texture information and all in all looks pretty cool, The big difference, the important thing you need to remember, is that the perspective view shows three-dimensional depth. You actually get a sense of how far away something is, where in the perspective views, you get no sense of depth whatsoever. They're like schematics or elevation drawings, where each object, no matter how close or far away it is from the camera, will always appear at at, at the same size. You get no sense of foreshortening. Now, let's talk just briefly about navigating these views. Now, to make things a little easier to see, I'm going to click down here in my perspective view in the lower left-hand panel, and I'm going to tap the G key to go into game mode. And what that's going to do is hide away any unnecessary actors that I don't want to see right now. Basically, this gives us a representation of what the level looks like when the player is going to be moving around in it. Now, to get around here inside the perspective view is very easy. I'm just going to hold down the left mouse button, and as I drag forward, you'll see the camera slides forward. As I drag back, the camera slides backward. If I drag to the left, the camera turns to the left. As I drag to the right, the camera turns to the right. So while you're holding down the left mouse button, you already have a lot of power to fly around and see this level from many different angles. It's kind of like driving a car around on a single plane. I mean, not really, because you can turn in a circle without moving, but it's similar. 
Now, if I drag with the right mouse button, this is kind of like rotating a camera that's on a pivot. So as I drag forward, I look up. As I drag back, I look down. If I drag to the left, I look left. If I drag to the right, I look right to the right. This is very much like turning your head on your neck, except, you know, if you want to, you can turn a full 360 degrees. So in between these two controls, we already have a whole lot of power. We can come look around the corner here with the left mouse button. And then if I want to look down at that tunnel, I can just rotate the camera down. But what if I want to actually go down there and look at it to move the camera vertically, we can hold down the left and right mouse buttons together. So as I do that, and drag back, I can move the camera down. If I drag forward, I can move the camera up. If I drag left, I slide the camera left. If I drag right, I slide the camera right. So between these two buttons, just holding down left, just holding down right, or holding down left and right together, you have complete control over moving all the way around your scene three-dimensionally. So just real quick review. Left mouse button allows for forward, back, and turning motion. Right mouse button allows you to rotate left, right, up, and down. And left and right together allows you to slide up, slide down, slide left, and slide right. If you've never done this kind of thing before, it can take a little bit of getting used to. If you're coming into UDK from an application such as Maya or 3ds Max, and you're used to holding down a key to get uh, various forms of navigation, it might be a little awkward at first, but once you get the hang of it, it's a very quick way to get around your scene. Now, later on, I will talk about a special navigation method just for you Maya users out there. Actually, Maya navigation has been mimicked inside of UDK, but I'm just going to leave that for a teaser right now, and we'll talk about it a little later. So that's some basic navigation here inside the perspective view. Now, how do you get around these orthographic views that are surrounding our perspective view? It's very similar. If we drag with the left mouse button, now I'm picking on the top viewport, which by default is in your upper left-hand corner. If we drag with the left mouse button, we can pan this around. It's kind of like grabbing a hold of the view and just sliding around as if it were a piece of paper. If I drag with the right mouse button, I do the same thing. So left and right are going to do essentially the same job here, where if we drag down, or actually if we drag backward toward yourself, you're going to be sliding the view down, push away, and you're going to be sliding the view up, and then left and right. It's very intuitive once you actually try it out. Now, if you hold down left and right together, so the left and right mouse button, and you pull back towards yourself, you're going to zoom in. If you hold down left and right together and push away, you're going to push the view away. It's kind of like zooming out. They're not really like zooming because you're actually moving the camera. So that is a quick look at orthographic navigation. Now this is going to be the same for all three of the other views. So as we drag around with left mouse, right mouse does the exact same thing. Left and right together allow us to zoom in and out. And between just those buttons, you have full power to get all the way around your scene. Now, that's it for your basic navigation. That's really everything you need to get wherever it is you want to go. I do want to mention this, though. Most folks, especially visual people, are going to be more drawn toward the perspective view. And this is just something I've noticed just you know, as being a teacher. You, you got to love the perspective view. It's so beautiful. It gives you a, a quick, instant gratification view of what your level is going to look like. But don't discount the orthographic views. They're great for pl precision placement of objects. You can use the top view to get an object oriented exactly where you want it to be, and then use a side view to slide it down exactly to the level it needs to be placed. Great for precision work. So be sure to Make yourself use all of the viewports, because as you do that, you're going to see the strength that each viewport has. So that'll wrap things up for this video. Thanks a lot. All right, let's take a look at the viewport toolbar. Every single viewport in UDK has its very own toolbar, but the options between them all are completely identical. So for the purposes of this video, I will only be looking at the viewport toolbar for the perspective view. Now, just to make things a little more visually stimulating, I'm going to do a couple of things. One, I'm going to open up a level. So let's go to File, Open, and I'm going to pick on VCTF Necropolis and click Open, and we get this massive level, which is a vehicle capture the flag map from Unreal Tournament 3. 
Now, I know we're talking about the viewport toolbar, and I'd like to do a left-to-right progression, but I'm going to break convention just a little bit. The very last button on the right of each toolbar is labeled Maximize Viewport. If you hold your mouse over it, you get a little tooltip for it. If you click on that, the perspective view will go just about full screen. It fills up the entire interface. So let's go ahead and do that. It'll make certain things that we show a little more obvious. Now moving over to the left hand side, we have the viewport options menu. If you click on this, there are a lot of different options. However, most of these are available as buttons of their own inside the toolbar. And wherever that's the case, we're not going to talk about them right now. We're actually going to wait until we get to the viewport toolbar button for that function. So at the very top, we have show. This is a submenu that gives you a list of different types of actors that you can show or hide at will. Now, if you're completely new to UDK and you don't have the first clue what half of these are and you don't know when you'll be using this, don't worry. The more you get used to using UDK, the more levels you create, you'll start to understand what each one of these things are and you'll start to realize that there are specific circumstances under which you may want to hide any number of these objects. As a case in point, if you look over on the right-hand side of the view, surrounding nearly every single surface in our level right now is kind of a pink wireframe. These are blocking volumes. These keep the player from snagging on a stray polygon or bumping into something they shouldn't. They basically offer an invisible collision surface during gameplay. If we don't like seeing those, if we find those distracting, we can come down inside the show list to volumes. Also notice that volumes is attached to the hotkey O. But we can uncheck volumes, and now all of those pink boxes disappear. If I want to, I can hit the O key here inside the view and bring those back. Now, again, if you don't really know what most of these objects are as you look through that list, again, I don't want you to worry about that now. But if you're ever working here inside a viewport, and there's a certain type of object that you're looking for and you feel should be visible and you just don't see it, this should be one of the first places your eyes go. You should jump right over to the viewport options and take a look in your show list. For example, if you're just starting a new level and you don't see the grid for some reason, remember to check and see if your grid is visible. Just as a side note about that, also make sure you're not in game mode, but that's something that we'll, we'll save for just a few more uh, lessons. Now, that's just a quick look at the show list. Again, a lot of different things here that you could potentially show or hide. Now down from here, we have real time, we have several different view modes, and we have game view. These are all analogous to various buttons along the toolbar, so we're not going to discuss those here in this video. The next option we have that is not its own button is the Unreal Matinee Preview. This allows you to determine whether or not matinee movies will play back in this viewport. This is on by default in the perspective view, but to really show it in action, let's open up a matinee animation. Now, inside of VCTF Necropolis, there are several different matinees that already exist. To open one of them up, you can click the Open Matinee button. It looks like a little tiny clapboard up in the main toolbar of the interface. If you click this, you'll get a big list of all of the different matinee sequences. Now, without getting too far off track, a matinee sequence is just some form of animation that was created with Unreal Matinee. What I want to do is select the very first one. It's labeled sequence.seekact underscore interp underscore six. If we click on that, we get the matinee window. You'll notice some sounds started playing in the background. If I click the play button here inside Unreal Matinee, and I'm not going to go into anything else in Matinee, but the play button's kind of obvious. If I click this, then here in the background, Matinee is actually showing us playback here inside the view. If we go back to the viewport options menu while this is playing and switch off Unreal Matinee Preview, that camera is going to fly on without us, which you just saw it do. But if I go back and switch Unreal Matinee Preview back on, we jump to the location of that camera. So it's just a way for you to preview any cinematics or any type of animation that you may have created with Matinee here inside the viewport. I'm going to go ahead and click Stop and Close Unreal Matinee, and that will just drop the camera back off here inside this building. So I'm just going to fly back out here and get us outdoors again. Now moving down, the next thing we have is unlit movement. If while you are editing your level, you notice that moving around the camera makes things get a little slow just because of all the added motion, maybe you've got a really complex scene, you can switch on unlit movement and watch this really closely. As I move the camera, all lighting information switches off. This can lead to much smoother motion if you're just trying to get around your view. 
And there you go. As soon as we stop moving the camera, the lights turn back on. So pretty obvious what that one's doing. Now, next we have view culling and occlusion. I'm going to hold on to that for just a moment. We're going to deal with that a little bit separately. And I'm going to jump right over to hidden groups. This submenu allows you to show and hide groups that you have created in your level. Now, with again, I don't want to get too far off track, but we can create our own groups. There's actually a separate browser window specifically for working with groups. I will show it to you real quick. If we go to the main menu bar, we go down to browser windows and choose the group editor. This window, without going too far into its functionality, allows us to create and edit groups of objects in our scene. For example, you see there's a lights group, and this contains all of the lights in the level. So you could sit here and selectively grab any one of these groups, grab the objects within them, and see what objects are, are placed you know, in any part of the level. Now, inside our viewport options menu, we can come down to hidden groups, and we can show or hide any one of these groups after they're created. That's really all there is to it. Very, very straightforward. But you have to have created a group on your own using the group editor for that to really be functional. Now, down from here, we have the viewport type. Now, currently, this is obviously a perspective view, but we can switch it over to a top view if we'd like. So now it's an orthographic top view. Notice it's still in lit mode. So everything still shows all sorts of nice lighting. I could go back down to the viewport type and I could set that to a front view, which is going to be really interesting to look at. There we go. Let's zoom out and now we can see that mountain. Or we could set it to a side view as well. Now I'm going to go back down here and set this back to perspective and give us that three-dimensional view once again. So that's a quick look at all those options. Now there was one left that I wanted to save, and that was view culling and occlusion. Now to show this off, let me get back over here to where I was. So we'll get over a little bit closer to the main part of the level. I'm just dragging with a left mouse button to get us a little closer to the main part of the action. I'm going to put us right down in the middle of this, staring at this bridge. Kind of moved far away when I jumped over to those orthographic views. Now let's demaximize the viewport. So remember that maximize viewport button we clicked? I'm going to click that again to make that go away. Now using some of the things we've already learned, I'm going to pick on this viewport here just to the right of our perspective viewport, and I'm going to set this to another perspective viewport. You can have as many perspective viewports as you like. Now let's take this one. We'll also set it to a lit mode. There's a, a lit button specifically for that. Or here inside the view, we can choose lit. Now what I'm going to do is navigate this camera so that both of these objects are looking at the same thing. Also, I'm going to put both of these cameras in game mode, okay? So I'm going to tap the G key in each one. So make sure you put focus in one view and tap G. Now let's put focus in the other and tap G as well. So both of these views are in game mode. They're both showing exactly what the player would see during gameplay. Now, all of that is just a setup to make sure that the view culling and occlusion option makes a little bit more sense because if you're totally new to UDK, this one might be a little bit confusing. What this option does is it turns whichever viewport you activate it for into the occlusion parent. Inside of Unreal, when you're actually playing the game, any object that is occluded, meaning it's hidden completely behind another object, or maybe it's just outside your field of view, that object will stop rendering. It'll literally turn invisible, and that keeps things nice and fast for the system. It doesn't render anything that the player isn't looking at. If you want to preview this effect, you can use the option View Culling and Occlusion. I'm going to take this horizontal splitter bar, and we'll slide that up a little bit so we really just have these two primary views. And then here on the left perspective view, I'm going to come down and switch on View Culling and Occlusion. Now take a look. On the right-hand side, we suddenly see the words Occlusion Child. So the view on the left is our Occlusion Parent. The view on the right is our Occlusion Child. I'm going to navigate around here inside our Occlusion Child view for a moment and get us really close to where this camera is. We can see the camera because it shows us all the, the points coming into the view over here, this kind of purple wireframe that we're looking at. And let's just get kind of right over that camera's shoulder at sort of a, a nice distance. Now watch, as I rotate the left-hand camera, I'm also going to switch the right-hand camera to real-time to make this really apparent. So there's a real-time button here, a little joystick. Now watch. As I switch this on, you see what's happening over in the right-hand view? Everything that falls out of range of the left-hand camera is disappearing. 
It's because those objects are occluded. Anything that is occluded from our occlusion parent is no longer visible. So this is just a way for you to preview how occlusion is working in your level. And again, it takes a little bit of setup to really understand what's going on. So what we did is we set up a second perspective view in lit mode, and we set it to real time so that in our occlusion child, we could see real time visibility changes for all of the objects in our scene as they become occluded. Now that is a quick look at many of the functions here inside our viewport options menu. Again, we didn't really hit on anything that has its own button. We'll talk about that as we move forward. But for now, we'll go ahead and end this video, and then we'll move forward and take a look at some of the other options here inside the viewport toolbar. Before we leave though, let's set everything back the way it was. I'm gonna come over to viewport options, switch off view culling and occlusion. Let's drag our splitter bar back down to about halfway, and then we'll grab this viewport and we'll set it back, set its viewport type back over to a front view, and then I'll go back under the menu one more time and we'll set it to brush wireframe view. So that will wrap up this video and we'll just move forward. Okay, as we move across the viewport toolbar, I'd like to take a nice left to right progression of each button. Now, this video is gonna be very short because all I'm gonna talk about is the real time button and I'm here inside DM Sanctuary. So if you'd like to follow along, make sure you have that open. The real time button allows you to preview any moving effects that you may have, as well as things like ambient sound. So if we kind of rotate around, just kind of look behind us, you see we have some ocean out here, kind of a, a nice water effect, and there's a particle system way out here arising from this tower, but right now none of it's moving. The, the water is perfectly stationary. If I switch on real time, we see those effects in motion. So any animated textures or materials, they're going to update. The particle system out here is emitting some really cool blue smoke kind of effects. The lens flare on the sun is actually behaving properly now. And if we fly back over to the level and get within range of them, we can hear the ambient sounds, if you listen. So any effect that is moving, including particle systems, materials, they're all going to update as soon as you switch on real time, but it has other uses as well. Let me switch off real time here inside the perspective view. And then let's fly out here to this kind of pier like area where we have these four pillars. Now I'm gonna select this pillar up here in the upper left corner and then in the top viewport, let's navigate so that we can see that as well. So you can see it being highlighted. Now in the perspective view, I'm gonna tap space bar until I see the move widget and I'm just gonna click on the green arrow, which allows us to move along the Y axis, and I'm gonna slide this object to the right. Now, as I'm moving it, I'm still holding down the mouse button. Take a look up in the top viewport. Do you notice anything moving? No, it's perfectly still. As soon as I let go of the mouse, though, the object jumps to its new location. That's all well and good, but if you're trying to really have some serious precision in moving the objects, it would be nice if you could get real-time feedback. If we come up here to the top view, and we switch on real time, now watch as I move the object. The viewport updates with every single tick so that as I slide the object around, I know exactly where it's going. So it's just one more use for real time aside for just seeing the kind of things that will be moving when the player's running around your world. So that wraps up this video. Thanks a lot. As we continue to move across the viewport toolbar, the next thing I wanna talk about are the 10 view modes that you have access to for each one of these viewports. Now, to give us a way to really see what these view modes are doing, we need to open up a level. So let's go to File, Open, and we'll choose VCTF Sandstorm, and click Open. Now, I'm just gonna kinda start on the left-hand side and work my way to the right. If we mouse over each one of these objects, each one of these little buttons, you're gonna see the name of the view mode. So there's Brush Wireframe, then Wireframe, Unlit, Lit, Lighting only, light complexity, texture density, shader complexity, light map density, and lighting only with texel density. So some of those sound a little bit complex. If you jump all the way back over to the viewport options, you can see each one of these here inside the menu along with their corresponding hotkeys. So you can hit Alt 1 through 0 and you can select any one of these. Now by default, here in the perspective view, we are in lit mode. This gives us lighting information as well as any material or texture information, allows us to really get an idea of what it is our level looks like. Now, 
the orthographic views, which surround our perspective view, by default, these are in brush wireframe mode. Now, if we take a look right next to wire to brush wireframe, we have just regular wireframe. As we click between the two, you'll notice that the modes look very, very similar. And if you're completely new to UDK, it's very easy to get the two confused. Now, obviously, what these are going to do is just show you the wireframe of your level. So I'm going to go ahead and switch it on here inside perspective. And now we can see the polygon edges that are making up every single sur uh, surface in our level, which is kind of nice. Uh, it allows us to really get an idea of our geometry. However, as I switch back and forth between wireframe and brush wireframe, the change that's going on is subtle, and I'd like to illustrate it by hiding a few objects. Let me take the perspective view, and I'm going to make it nice and big by clicking the Maximize Viewport button located at the far right-hand side of the viewport toolbar. Now, let's tap the W key, and what that's going to do is hide out any static meshes that we may have. I'm also going to tap the T key, and that's going to hide out any terrains that we might have. And if you have any volumes visible, you can hit the O key to make those disappear. So that's W, T, and O. Now currently, I am in brush wireframe view, and you're going to see a lot of these shapes scattered across the level, like blue, interesting shapes. They're kind of like elongated boxes. These are BSP brushes. These are being used to define the shapes of various surfaces in our level. Now, I'm not going to go into any BSP creation techniques right now, but the more you start creating levels inside UDK, the more you're going to get used to how these brushes are created and their importance in a level. However, the engine itself during gameplay doesn't actually see these brushes. Each of these shapes, like if I select this BSP brush right here, which is now highlighted, this is an additive brush. All it's doing is defining an area of space with which mass will be added. Basically, it's going to create a polygon model in the shape of this volume. If we switch over to wireframe view, I'm just going to deselect our brush and switch over to regular wireframe, we can actually see the geometry that's being created as a result of that brush. Now at this stage of the game, again, if you're completely new and you don't really understand the correlation between these two objects, it can be simplified a little bit. When you're in brush wireframe, you can select these brushes and potentially, if you were so inclined, you could move them around. Uh, you could edit them, you could uh, change their shape in geometry mode if you wanted to. However, inside of just regular wireframe mode, you can't select these brushes and you can't update them. So that's, that's the real primary difference here. So let's go ahead and switch on to our next view, which is unlit. Now unlit's going to look really sparse for a minute, so I need to bring back my static meshes. I'll do that by tapping the W key. I need to bring back my terrain, so I'll tap the T key, and I'll go ahead and leave the volumes out of the way. So I'm not going to worry about pressing the O key. Now, unlit is going to give us our texture, material information, but no lighting information whatsoever. It'll make the game look very flat, uh, very much like games used to look uh, several years ago. If we switch over to lit, the difference becomes obvious. So there's with our lighting information, and of course there's without. Now, we can also take a look at lighting only. So we have unlit, then we have lit. We also have lighting only, which is kind of the opposite of unlit. This gives us our lighting information, but no texture or material information whatsoever. It's just the result of our lighting on kind of a neutral white surface. So if you want to see how our shadows are falling, you can get a really good idea of that sort of thing just by going to lighting only. Now, the next several view modes that we have access to here inside the viewport toolbar are kind of like diagnostic modes. They're ways that you can get an idea of certain performance issues in your map. The first of which is light complexity. And if you switch it on, in this particular case, nearly the entire level turns bright green, which is actually a good thing. What this mode allows you to do is visualize how many dynamic lights are affecting any given object. Green means they're only being affected by one light, which is what you want. As soon as any given object in your level is being affected by more than one dynamic light, you can start to run into performance issues. Now, that's not going to be something that will be really important to you until you start playing a lot with lighting and creating dynamic lights. But for the time being, it's, it's enough just to let you know what this does. If you see something like this where your whole level pretty much turns green, then essentially that's what you want, and unless there's a circumstance where you absolutely have to have multiple dynamic lights affecting an object, in which case 
that object will start to shift over to the warm spectrum, over through oranges and into red. Now, next to this, we have texture density. And this starts to look really cool. What this allows you to do is visualize how tightly packed the texture pixels of any given object are. So just as an example, let's pick on this stairway. So if we look at this in lit mode, you can see what it looks like. And let me go ahead and just kind of deselect it. So we've got some stonework. It's got a nice normal map on it, which makes it look kind of chipped. Really, really nice weathered look. Now, if we switch back over to texture density, it's green. All right, and there are other things around here that are blue. This spectral shift is helping you to see how compressed any texture happens to be. As you shift over from blue to red, a texture is becoming much more tightly packed. If I rotate us around, we can take us to these ramps, and you'll see that these are starting to turn kind of orange. This means that the textures are much more packed here in these areas than they are over on any of the blue or green objects. As a matter of fact, if I select this object and we start to scale it down, which I'm going to do by grabbing the draw scale fields at the bottom of your screen here in the console bar, I'm going to take that first number and we're going to set that down to 0.5. And take a look at what happens. This object becomes a lot smaller, obviously, but it started to turn red. What that means is the same amount of texture is now covering a much smaller object. So the texture is getting much more tightly packed together. The reason that's important is that essentially this has just this exact same amount of texture information as does its larger counterpart. And you have to kind of start to gauge whether or not you really need that much information on so small of an object. Every single texture that you use is more memory that is, be, is required for your level. So if you have a lot of surfaces in your level that are turning orange or red, that means you have probably have a lot more texture information than you really need on those objects. So that's really what that boils down to. Now, if we switch over to shader complexity, we get yet another color scheme. This gives us feedback on how many shader instructions are in each material applied to the surfaces of our level. The green objects have a very low number of instructions, and the more instructions or the more complex that material gets, the color is going to shift over to the warm spectrum. So generally, you want to see uh, green objects. Now, our terrain is red. That has a lot of different layers to give us various effects. If we switch over to lit mode, we've got kind of a, a primary material across the whole thing that's being blended through to show some rocks. There are several different things going on here. So that's going to be one of the more complex materials, just to kind of give you an idea of what you're looking at. Now, as we switch over from here, we have the light map density. Now, light maps are the way that baked lighting works inside your UDK levels. A lot of the lighting you see across the surface of a level is pre-calculated before the player ever sees the world. It allows things to be handled a lot, a lot more quickly when the player is actually running around if a lot of that lighting information is already pre-baked. This light information is stored inside what is called a light map, and you can get an overall idea of how dense your light maps are, meaning how much memory would be required to produce that light map using this system. So you can set up the ideal density, you can set up the maximum amount of density that you'd be willing to tolerate, which by default is set to three, and then you're going to get some color coding to represent how dense your light maps are. Now, by default in this particular level, the light maps are all pretty low, and it's a little hard to see which objects have tighter, uh, tighter light maps, but you can see we have some objects here that obviously have much more dense light maps. If we switch back over to lit mode, we can see why. They've got some interesting uh, lit properties about them, much smaller models. Now, if we switch back over to light map density, if we're just ha kind of having a hard time visualizing with everything being so dim, we can take our grayscale scale and increase that. And that's just kind of taking the overall output and boosting the contrast on it. Now, if we switch off render grayscale, we get color feedback here. And this is the same thing you were looking at before. No information has changed, but you start off with blue being your lowest level of density, and that's going to start shifting up to a warm spectrum. So if we take our color scale and increase that, we can already see that spectral shift starting to take place where certain objects are starting to shift over toward a, a bluish green. So that's a quick look at our light map density. Our last view mode is lighting only with texel density. Now this looks a lot like lighting only. As a matter of fact, let's just jump back over to lighting only. 
And you can see the difference between the two. And I can close the density rendering options window. We don't need that anymore. The difference is that lighting only with texel density allows you to see how compressed your textures are at the same time you're looking at your lighting information. And in this case, it's visualized through these checkers. The smaller these checkers, the tighter your texture is compressed. That's really all there is to it. That means you've got a lot more texture information crammed into a small space. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the term texel, it's just a combination of the word texture and the word pixel. So it's just a single texture pixel or a pixel of any given texture is referred to as a texel. So that is a quick look at all of the different view modes. Most of these are really just diagnostic views to help you uh, nail down and deal with performance problems in your level. The big players here are going to be your lit mode, which you'll be using a lot inside your perspective viewport. Just as a quick review, we have brush wireframe, which allows you to see your BSP brushes. Regular wireframe, which shows you the resultant geometry of your BSP brushes. We have unlit, which shows you your texture information, but no lighting info. We have lit mode, which is just, it's the pretty version. <laughs> we have lighting only, which doesn't show any of your textures. Light complexity, this gives you how many dynamic lights are affecting each individual object. Texture density, which is how tightly crammed your textures are on any given surface. Shader complexity, which is how many instructions are within any material on the surfaces of your objects. Light map density, which is how dense or how much memory is going to be required for all of the light maps in your level. And finally, lighting only with texel density, which is just a way of looking at your lighting information combined with how tightly uh, compressed all of your textures are across the surfaces of your level. So that is going to wrap things up for this video. Thanks a lot. All right, let's move on down the viewport toolbar. The next two buttons I'm going to discuss are game view mode and the lock viewport button. Now, to make things nice and easy to see, let's go ahead and click the Maximize Viewport button, which is down at the far end. Now, if we take a look at this level, currently I have opened up DM Sanctuary. You can go to File, Open, and choose that if you'd like to follow along exactly. You can see that we have all of these little actors everywhere. There's path nodes to help the AI get around. There are little sound nodes. You can see the little particle system icons. There's even blocking volumes around static meshes to keep you from bumping into those. If you want to hide all that sort of thing and get a closer representation of what the player is going to see when they're running through your level, just click the Game View Mode button. So you'll notice that all those actors disappear. The whole level looks a little bit cleaner now. You also get a little bit of a representation of the uh, post-process effect that's being applied to the level. This is also partially because of the post-process volume previs button, which we'll talk about a bit later. So that's really all game mode is here for. It's just a way to hide out anything you don't need to see and give you a much closer representation of what the player is going to see. You can kind of complete the effect if you also switch on real time along with it. So this looks very much like what the player is going to see when they're running around through your level. So I'll go ahead and switch that off. We'll get out of game mode. Though I do want to mention this. If I select a static mesh, Currently, I have the translation widget uh, activated here inside the main toolbar, and I have a little move tool or translation widget that I can use to move this static mesh around. If you are in game mode, that widget disappears. So if you're clicking on things and you don't see your widget, this is one of the places where your eyes should cut to. You should quick, you know, quickly take a look up here. Now, another place, just uh, not to stray too far away from the topic at hand, you could also be in selection mode, which is uh, up here inside the main toolbar. It looks like a little white arrow cursor. I just want to point both those out because both these are options that could potentially make your translation, rotation, or scale widget disappear. All right, our next button is going to be lock viewport. What this is here for is just a way to take a viewport and tell it not to move in the event of certain commands. For instance, if I demaximize the viewport, here inside the perspective view, I'm kind of out at this dock in front of the sanctuary level. And what I'm going to do is move my top viewport out there as well. So now they're both kind of out here in the same location. Now I can select one of these pillars, and here inside the top view, you can see that pillar. What I'm going to do is orient my top view so it's, he's looking right at that. Now down here in perspective, I'm going to say, let's come all the way over here back to this kind of chapel area, and I'm looking at this static mesh. Now what if I want all of my viewports to snap right here to this object, but I don't want the top view. The, the top view is exactly where I need it to be. I don't want it to move. I can use the lock viewport button to do that. And then if I move all of my other viewports, I can do this with the home key. So watch this. If I hit home, watch my upper right and lower right viewports. 
they all pop their locations just a little bit to get right where I want to be. In fact, to make it really obvious, I'm going to zoom into something way out here in the distance. And then, if again, if I hit home, my other two viewports snap right to that location. So here, it's really obvious here in the side view. We're looking right at where we want to be. However, the top view did not move because currently it's locked. And really, that's the big deal here. It's just a way to take a viewport and say, hey, you stay still, and if I tell the other viewports to move, I want you to stay right where you are. That's all there is to it. So that's a quick look at game view mode and the locked viewport mode, and that's going to wrap things up for this. The next button we're going to take a look at here in the viewport toolbar is the lock selected actors to camera button. It's located right next to the lock viewport button. The purpose of the lock selected actors to camera button is to take a selected object and allow you to move it around with the camera. If you think about it, when you're moving objects around, so let's say you walk over here to this pillar and you think, you know what, this pillar needs to be lifted up into the air. So I grab my translation widget and I slide it up. That's kind of like moving an object with your mind. In the real world, you would have to walk over to that object and actually lift it up. And that's kind of how the lock selected actors to camera button works. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick on this little tiny pedestal mesh that's right here at the end of the stairwell. And to make it really easy to see what's going on, I'm going to move the top view around so it's also looking at the same little pedestal mesh. So, down here in perspective, I'm going to, with this mesh selected, notice I do have it selected, I'm going to click on Lock Selected Actors to Camera, and then I'm just going to start to move the camera just a little bit and watch really closely what happens. If we take a look up here in the top view, our mesh has jumped to the location of my view. Now to really make it clear, I'm going to switch over to real time mode up here in the top viewport and watch as I rotate the camera, that mesh is following my camera around. So I could just fly my camera to wherever I needed this mesh to go. When I'm done, when I have the thing pretty much where I think I need it, I can switch off lock selected actors to camera and let's just make sure we follow this guy over here in the top view. So as soon as I switch this off and I slide back, that's where the mesh is placed. Now that's one way that you can use this tool. So you'll notice the workflow that I did was I selected the object, I clicked lock selected actors to camera, and then I moved the camera. And that'll make the object pop to the location of the camera. So if you move the camera first, the object will jump to the camera. However, there's another way to use it too. If we jump into the mode so if we click lock selected actors to camera and then click on the object we actually pop the camera to the location of the object so it just depends on which way you want to go if you'd like the object to come to you then just move the camera and it'll jump right to you if you want to take the camera to the location of the object then click on the object and it'll jump the camera right there now not to get too far ahead of ourselves there is one place where this is really really useful I'm gonna jump out of here we'll just kinda leave that pedestal floating one of the primary places that I use this tool is in the positioning of cameras for matinee sequences. So to really make this clear, what I'm going to do is bring in a, a camera. So I'm going to click on the Open Content Browser button. Actually, you know what? I don't want you to look for a button right now. Let's just go up to the View menu because that's easier. We'll go to Browser Windows, and I'm going to come down to Actor Classes. Now, inside the Actor Classes list, you're going to see Camera Actor. I'm just going to click that and then close the actor classes browser. And with that selected, I can right click here inside the perspective view. And here on the floor, we can choose add camera actor here. Don't accidentally click replace with camera actor. That would be bad. Click add camera actor here. And we get a little camera. Now I can move this camera wherever I want. So I can use the little move widget. I can tap space bar and grab the rotation widget. And I can rotate the camera around. But this is kind of like aiming a camcorder from across the room. It's very difficult to get an idea of what this camera is looking at. And this is one of the great places where lock selected actors to camera really shines. So if I click lock selected actors to camera and then click on this camera, we've jumped our viewports camera into exactly what this camera is seeing. So I can now just use my viewport controls and let's say I want to come out here to this dock and I want to get a really nice shot of this dock. So we're going to kind of get up into the air, get a nice three-quarter view where we could watch a player spawn in or something. When I'm finished, click Lock Selected Actors to Camera again and pull back and take a look. That camera is pointed exactly where I need it to be. So that's a quick look at the Lock Selected Actors to Camera button. Again, useful for moving objects around using your viewport's camera. I use it the most when I'm actually positioning cameras for a matinee sequence, and that is going to wrap this video up. 
The next button on our viewport toolbar is Level Streaming Volume Previs. Now this is a very, very specific button. It's really only going to be useful, one, if you're using level streaming, and two, if you're streaming by way of level streaming volumes. So what I've done is I've set up a really quick example of a level streaming system. So without going too far kind of off topic into how level streaming works, what you've got here is two separate levels. We have a level here on the left and a level on the right. These are both set up in a level streaming system so that when we start the game, we're already sitting in level one. As we cross the little gantry way, we pass into a level streaming volume, which will stream level two into memory so that we can use it. Now here's what this actually looks like while we play. So here we are inside of level one. If we look across the way, level two doesn't exist. Now generally you wouldn't want to set a system up like this. You want to kind of hide it from the player. But for an example, as we pass into that big volume, bink, the second level becomes available. So now we can run around in it. Now watch this. As we start to jump back out, once we clear that volume, once we step out of it, boom, the second level disappears. So really, this is just an optimization system that allows you to stream levels in and out of memory to keep things nice and tidy for really, really big levels. It's just you wouldn't normally want to let the player see you bringing them in and out of existence. Now, that brings us back to the level streaming volume previs button. The purpose of this button is to allow you to preview the way these level streaming volumes are going to work right here inside your viewport. So if I turn that on, notice level 2 disappears until I pass back into that volume and then it appears again. So if we switch off that behavior, the level is always visible if it was visible to begin with. If it's invisible and we switch it off, then it's just going to remain invisible. So that's really all there is to the level streaming volume previs button. It's a very, very specific button, only usable when you're using level streaming and when you're handling level streaming through volumes. And that will wrap things up for this video. The last several buttons in the viewport toolbar are all very straightforward, so I'd like to go through them all just kind of in one real quick go. Now this includes post-process volume previs, toggle squint mode, camera movement speed, play in viewport, tear off floating copy, and finally maximize viewport, which I already have active in this case, so let me go ahead and just switch that off. Now, I have opened up the CTF Sandstorm for this example, which you're welcome to open up on your end as well, though it's not really necessary. You can open up any level and get an idea of what these do. Now, the first button is Post Process Volume Previs. Now, what this does is this allows you to activate and deactivate the effects of any post-process volumes that may be applied in your level. Now, this is not going to be particularly useful if you're not in game mode. So I'm going to switch over to game view mode by clicking on the little letter G here. And now as I switch off post-process volume previs, you can see what kind of happens here. We get this kind of nice yellowish uh, post-process effect that really kind of makes it look like we have a lot of dust hanging in the air. Like you should almost be having a hard time breathing here. If we switch off post-process volume previs, that goes away. So we're just getting an idea of how that post-process is affecting our scene. That's really all there is to it. Now we also have squint mode. Squint mode is really it's just a way for you to see what your level would look like if you were squinting your eyes. This is really good if you're trying to get an idea of the overall color and tone of your level. Uh, oftentimes, if you're building something inside your, your levels, like at least back in the day, you'd find yourself kind of squinting at your monitor just to get an idea of how overall colors were, were blending together. And now you don't have to do that. You can just switch squint mode on and off. However, as with post-process volume previs, you will want to be in game mode to see the results. So if you're clicking the squint mode button and you're not getting any results, switch over to game view mode, and then there you go. Now next to this, we have the camera movement speed button. We have two ways we can use this. What this does really is it allows us to change how quickly our camera moves through our level. So let me switch over to game mode just because it kind of smooths things out. So I'm just moving my mouse a little bit and there's how quick we're moving. If I left click on this button, we go all the way to full speed and now I'm flying quite a bit more quickly. And if I click it again, we go to low speed and now I'm moving very slowly. Now that's me moving my mouse at pretty much the same rate each time. If you play with it, it starts to become really clear how this works. If you right click on it, you can actually choose from a drop down which speed you want. So I'm just going to leave it at normal. Now next to this we have what is probably my favorite button in the entire viewport. I'm going to save it for last because it's too cool and I'll get distracted. Uh, let's jump over one to tear off floating copy. Uh, the name pretty much says exactly what it does, but let's go ahead and click on it anyway. And we get a little floating viewport. 
So if you want a separate copy, you can drag this over to a separate monitor, or if you've got like a browser window up and you also want to be able to see a viewport, uh, these tear-off windows can be very handy. When you're done, just close them and they go away. We have the Maximize Viewport button, which I've already been using if you've been watching these videos. It just kind of helps when you're demonstrating. If you click on this, your viewport gets maximized. That's really all there is to it. When you're done, you can click it again, and that'll demaximize and put everything back down to its normal size. Which brings us two buttons back to Play in Viewport, the coolest button in the whole Viewport toolbar, because you can click this, and you get a little bit of a, a load. And then, as soon as that's done referencing all the shaders... You are on we can actually play the game right here inside the viewport, which, as far as I'm concerned, is just one of the coolest things ever. So if you really want an idea of how your level is playing, how your game is working out, then uh, you can test it right here inside the viewport without having to do anything special. So that, I think, wraps up all of the remaining buttons for the viewport toolbar, and that will also wrap up this video. Thanks. I want to take just a moment and discuss some alternative navigation methods for your perspective viewport. If you have a number pad on your keyboard, you can actually use that number pad while you have focus inside your perspective viewport to slide forward and back. Now this is with the 8 key to go forward and the 2 key to go backward. I can slide left with the 4 key, right with the 6 key. If I hit the 7 key, I go down. If I hit the 8 key, I'm sorry, the 9 key, so 7 to go down, 9 to go up. If I hold down the 1 key, I zoom out, like so. If I hold down the 3 key, I can zoom in, which is very cool. Now, very similar controls can actually be found over on your WASD keys. So if you've already been playing games like Unreal Tournament 3 on your PC, uh, you'll be very used to this. All you have to do is hold down the right mouse button. So while you're holding down the right mouse button, you may already be aware that you can rotate the camera around. But while the button's being held down, you can also use the W key to go forward. And if you combine this with rotating your mouse around, you can get some really nice, kind of almost flight simulator style feel. You can hit A to strafe to the left, D to strafe to the right, S if you want to fly backward. So it's kind of like ghost controls. Now if you hit the Z key, you zoom back. Now notice, in, in this case, while we're holding right mouse, it actually maintains that level of zoom. If we hit the C key, we can zoom in. So if you want to look at something way in the distance, you can do that. It's almost like having a, a sniper rifle or a, a camcorder. So it's just some alternate ways you can get around your scene if you don't want to have to drag with a left mouse button. If you just kind of feel a little more natural using WSAD controls, you can do that this way. Now, I'll just take a quick look at what I did. I let off the right mouse button, and I was still holding down W, so all of my static meshes disappeared. That's just one of those things that you should probably be aware of. W does that. It hides static meshes. So if you're really doing this a lot, and you let off your mouse button first, your static meshes will start to flicker. It's not a problem. It's just something that you should be aware of so you don't you know, get scared. Oh, no, all my static meshes are gone. And then you'll know why. So that's just some quick alternate ways to get around your scene if you don't want to use the standard left, right, and left and right together uh, mouse button navigation, and that will wrap things up for this video. Thanks. For those of you out there who happen to be Maya users, you are a bit in luck because there is a special form of viewport navigation for the perspective viewport that mimics Maya behavior. Now currently I'm inside VCTF Sandstorm, which you can open up if you'd like to follow along, and I have activated game view mode just because it makes the viewport look so nice. I'm also going to maximize the viewport, make everything nice and big. Now to activate Maya style viewport navigation, you have two options here. The first is you can hold down the U key. And now while I'm holding down U, the behavior of my mouse buttons will change. Now while I'm holding down U, left mouse will rotate the camera around. Right mouse will allow me to dolly the camera in and out. And middle mouse, which is actually your mouse wheel, if you click on that, that's going to slide your camera left, right, and in its own local up and down axis. So kind of like in a plane that is oriented to the camera. Now what I mean by that is if I'm looking straight down and I drag with middle mouse, you'll notice I'm just kind of tracking along the ground. If I rotate the camera up and I use the same middle mouse button, same thing, I'm actually sliding down. So we're actually kind of sliding along a plane that orients itself along with the camera. So again, that's left to rotate the mouse, right to dolly in and out, and then middle to kind of slide along its own local plane. 
Now, that's very cool. It's almost just like Maya. However, in Maya, you might be more used to uh, tumbling around an object with the left mouse button. So what we're going to do is use the L key. This is our other Maya navigation button. And if I have an object selected and I hold the L key and start dragging with left mouse, it snaps the camera around that object's pivot so we can now tumble around that object. So if I grab this little static mesh here on the side, hold down L, and then drag, we're now rotating around that mesh, which can be very handy, especially if you're trying to get an idea of how something is positioned relative to other objects in your level. Now, that's with left mouse button I'm tumbling, right mouse I can dolly toward and away from that object, and then middle mouse again just kind of allows me to slide around a local plane. So if you're used to Maya style viewport navigation and you'd rather use that than the standard left, right, and left and right together middle mouse buttons, you have that option and that will wrap things up for this video. The file menu is really all about file handling. You'll see this kind of menu in a lot of different apps, and I'm sure you're used to the options that you see in here. You can create a new level, you can open an existing level, you can save any changes you've made to your level, or save as if you want to make a separate copy. This is really useful if you grab one of the existing levels that comes with UDK and you want to make some changes to it and kind of make your own version. Now underneath this you'll see save all and force save all. These two options have to do with level streaming. So if you have several different levels that you've streamed together and you've made changes in multiple levels, you can save all of the changes across all of the different levels. You can import and export levels into your scene. You can open up any recent files you might have opened, and of course you have exit. That's really all there is to it, a very straightforward menu. The edit menu contains a series of commands for working with objects. You'll notice a lot of things in here that you'll probably find in the edit menus of various other applications, such as undo and redo, which generally I would find myself using control Z more often than not, but they're right here inside the menu anyway. We have the ability to change our transformation widget. So we have translate, rotate, and scale, which is of course like move, rotate, and scale. Currently I have the translation widget active, which you can see here in my perspective viewport. If I switch over to rotate, you'll notice that updates to our three rotation circles. And if we set it to scale, we have our scale widget as well. If we don't want to see the transform widget at all, we can just switch that off right here, and now that's out of the way. We can also cut, copy, and paste objects. So if we want to make a copy of a uh, static mesh, for example, we can hit Control C or just come over here to copy, and then we can hit Control V or choose paste. So very common feature that you'll find even in uh, word processing do uh, document creation applications, that sort of thing. Now, moving down from here, we have duplicate and delete. So if you don't want to do the whole Control C, Control V thing, you can just select an object and choose duplicate, and it'll just automatically create a duplicate for you, or you can delete it right here. Next, we have some selection options. We can choose select none if we don't want to select anything in the scene, or of course we have select all. We can invert a selection, which means eh, if you want to select everything except one object. You could, for instance, select that object and then choose invert selection. You can also select by property. And at the very bottom, we have the find actors option. And if you click on this, this gives you a nice little search window to help you find any particular object. So we could, for instance, type in point if we want to find a specific point light. And here's a list of all of the point lights in our scene. We could click on any one of these, maybe double click it, and we'll actually select and jump right to it. And we'll talk a bit more about the search for actors window a little bit later later once we get to its icon in the main toolbar. So that's just a quick look at the edit menu. Very straightforward. A lot of the same options you'll find in the edit menus of various other applications, and that will wrap up this video. The view menu allows for control and visibility of various parts of the UDK interface. Starting here at the top, we have the browser windows, and you'll see a sub-menu with all the different browser windows you can open up. Though really, you could grab any one of them, and you're going to get a window that has tabs for all the others as well. So if you just grab the content browser, you can quickly jump over to the log or the start page, which are also included in that sub-menu. Now moving down from here, we have the actor properties window. You'll be using this a lot as you set up the objects in your scene. So. I'm actually here inside the VCTF Sandstorm level. I'm just going to select this static mesh. We'll go under View, come down to Actor Properties, and there you go. So there's the properties of this static mesh actor. Though admittedly, I never come up to the menu to open up this uh, particular window. You can just double click on any object, and that will open up its properties. Or if you don't like double clicking, you can press F4 as well, and that will open up its properties. Now, moving down from here, we have the Surface Properties window. Now, to really show off surface properties, I need to get over here to a BSP surface. So let's come over here to this little platform. And if we select this, this is an object that was created 
via BSP. I'm going to jump out of game mode so that we can see that it is selected. And if I open up the Surface Properties window by going under View, Surface Properties, we have a huge number of options here that will control how this surface looks. We can control the positioning of its texture. We can control its light map resolution. Just as a quick example, I'll pen its texture. So notice I'm clicking uh, the four in the U direction, and that's moving the texture four units along its U direction. I can also move it in V if I want, just as a quick example. So this is just a way to control those BSP surfaces. Now moving down, we have the World Properties window. This has got a lot of things that control your level in general, just all around properties that are applied to your entire world. You can control uh, various settings and light mass in here, as well as the zone info, which in this case shows the kill Z. This means that if your player drops below this altitude, they will die. So if you have a part of your level that's like a cliff that your player needs to fall off of, and when they fall, you need them to die, you can do that just by setting the kill Z to the altitude at which they need to die. Now, continuing down the menu, we have the ability to open up the Kismet and Matinee windows. So I'll just go ahead and open these up real quick. Here's the Kismet window with some Kismet sequences, in this case, powering a camera fly through, through Matinee. If you go down to Matinee, this will give you a sub-menu containing all of the different Matinee sequences applied to your level, provided there are any. Now, the Kismet and Matinee in and of themselves are something we're going to save for future lessons, but just as a case in point, I could open up this first sequence which is for that camera fly through. And if we move the, ca the view kind of down a little bit, I can hit play and you can see that down here inside our perspective, we've got a little camera fly through preview taking place. But for now, we'll go ahead and stop that and close out of matinee. Now, continuing down the view menu, we have our drag grid, rotation grid, and scale grid settings. These control snapping. In short, the drag grid controls motion snapping Rotation grid is rotation snapping, and scale grid is, of course, scale snapping. And these all work the same way. You can enable or disable them at the very top, and then you have the increment of snapping that you'd like. So in the case of the drag grid, if you set this to 16, as you move objects around in your scene, they're going to snap to 16 unit increments. Very, very straightforward. For rotation, you can snap to increments of around 6 degrees. There's a little bit of play in there, uh, as well as 45 and 90 degrees as well. And scale is going to snap to percentage. So do you want to scale up by snaps of 5% and then it'll jump to 10% and then 15 and so on and so forth. Now, as we continue down, we have the ability to set our auto save interval. This is how often UDK is going to save your level while you work. Now, you'll notice there's no option in here to turn auto save on and off. Actually, to do that, you need to come down to the lower right hand corner of your interface in the console bar. Way in the far right corner, there's a little checkbox to turn auto save on and off if you need to do that. Now, I generally leave that off for recording so that we don't get interrupted by a save window, but it's probably a good idea to leave that on just so you never lose any work. Now, moving down from here, we have detail mode. This allows us to have certain objects that are designated as high detail, and we can switch these on and off if we need to kind of speed up feedback in our viewport. So if I switch to low detail, you'll notice those mountains in the, in the background kind of disappear, and then we can put these back up to high, and boom, there they are again. Now, continuing... We have several different options, most of which can be found inside the main toolbar. Now, what I'm going to do is give you kind of a brief rundown of each one of these. And a lot of these are fairly specific. So if you don't fully understand their, uh, their nature after the description, it's just because at this point you haven't worked with that part of UDK yet. The more you work with UDK, the more this is all going to make a whole lot more sense. But I will give you a brief rundown of what these do. Allow translucent selection is for certain instances where you're using, say, static meshes that have a translucent material. Just as a case in point, perhaps you have a static mesh that's cone-shaped and has a material that makes it look like a volumetric light. You know when you shine a spotlight up into the air, how you can see that kind of cone of light reaching up into the sky? You could create a static mesh that mimics that. However, if you tried to select anything through that, the question is, do you want to select what's beyond that cone of light? Kind of maybe a wall that's in the distance, or do you want to select the cone of light itself? If you want to select the actual cone that's forming that, you need to switch on Allow Translucent Selection. You have the ability to draw the red builder brush. If it's getting in your way, maybe you have a small level and you just need to make the thing disappear, you can switch this on and off. Moving down, we have Lock Prefabs from Selection. 
A prefab is a group of objects that you have designated that you decide need to go together. A really good example would be uh, perhaps a static mesh of a lamp post that's got a little light attached to the end of it, and maybe uh, a, a newspaper box that's always going to be right next to that uh, that lap, lamp post wherever you place it in a level. You could define all of those objects as a single prefab and move them around as one object. And really, the lock prefabs from selection just determines whether or not you want to be able to select those as a single prefab or as the individual components that make it up. Next, we have use curves for distributions. This is fairly particular to working with particle systems. There are certain values in particle systems, and let's just let's pick on an example. Let's say you've got a smoke particle system, where you've got this smoke that goes up into the air, and as it goes up, it's also increasing in size. So you've got some motion, and you've got a size increase over time. Now, inside, kind of under the hood of UDK, that is graphed out as a curve. That curve is plotting how large the particle is getting over its lifespan. However, calculating values as they change across a curve is fairly expensive. And so to save on the processing power of having to do that, UDK will bake everything out into what is called lookup tables. It's just kind of an internal chart where it says, all right, at one second into your life, you need to be this big. At two seconds, you need to be this big, and so on and so forth. However, this simplification can lead to it could potentially lead to problems if you're not getting the results you want. Perhaps you need it to be smoother to really see what's going on. And if that's the case, you can switch on use curves for distributions to kind of help you debug such problems. Next, we have enable socket snapping. I think the place where I use this the most is when I'm trying to put objects into characters' hands or attach an object to a character so they can hold it. A skeletal mesh, which would be what a general character is going to be made of if you're putting one into a level to animate, has got sockets on it. Now, a socket is really just a designated position where another object could potentially be attached. Case in point, you've got a character in your level who would have a socket at the location of their hand. So you could take another object, say a weapon, and snap it directly to that socket by using enable socket snapping. It's just an easy way to get objects positioned right into a skeletal mesh's socket. Moving down from here, we have enable particle system LOD. This is going to allow you to visualize different levels of detail for a particle system. Now, a really good example of this, just kind of a, in concept, would be if you had, say, a campfire particle system, which has got some flames and it's got some smoke coming up, and then little tiny sparks that are also kind of moving up through the smoke. If you were 300 yards away from that campfire, all you'd really see is a little tiny glowing orange dot in the distance. You wouldn't be able to see the individual flames. You might notice a slight flicker, but you surely wouldn't be able to see those sparks. However, by default, those sparks would be calculating unless there was a level of detail, an LOD, in place to take them away as the player moves further back. Switching on Enable Particle System LOD allows you to visualize those levels of detail right here inside your viewports. So if you need to edit them, if you decide, you know, we need to make that fire a little simpler if we're far away, or even make it a little more complex because now it's too simple, you can see that right here inside your viewport. You can also lock LODs in your view so that if you're far away, you can you know, have the lower level LOD in place and then get closer and see what that low LOD looks like as you get close to it. Now down from here, we have enable quick proc building mode. Proc building is a procedural building generation system inside of Unreal Editor. It allows you to create buildings in a procedural system by, say, designating a window on the side of the building and then how many times that window is going to repeat and then those you can basically develop rule sets and then entire buildings like an entire cityscape could be created by way of these rules and if you want to be able to see that you can switch that on here now moving down we have the new floating viewport option this is really straightforward so if you want a new floating perspective view you just click and boom there you go we have our very own brand new floating perspective view when you're done with it just close it and make it go away Continuing, we have viewport configuration. This is this is where you can really start to customize how your viewports look. By default, this is set to 2x2 two two split, which is why we see these four viewports. But you could set it to something like 1x2 split, and you have one big viewport on the left and two smaller ones on the right. Again, very, very straightforward. Now, I do want to mention this. If this is not something that you will often see, but it could potentially come up. If you have been messing with your computer's resolution while UDK is running, or for a variety of other reasons, if you ever happen to notice that your viewports have gone blank or you don't see any information, 
consider coming in here to view and just setting your viewport configuration back to two by two. It'll redraw the viewports and can clear up any tiny little issues like that. Now that rarely ever happens. In fact, I think it's been years since I've ever seen it, but I thought I'd mention it just in case anybody ever experienced that. Now moving along, we have full screen mode. This will hide away anything that is not UDK, including the Windows control bar at the top and the start bar, which you didn't even see at the bottom of my screen. So we'll go ahead and switch that back off. Down from here, we have several different lighting information windows. These are just debugging and info windows on how lighting is affecting various objects, uh, the overall result of your lighting, how it's working on static meshes, etc., and so forth. So until you're really getting hardcore into playing with lighting, you won't really need to use these just yet. However, a lot of these will come up automatically when you build lighting in your scene. Now, moving down, we have a few last-minute preferences. Enable WASD camera controls. This is on by default, and this is why if you hold the right mouse button, you can use WAS and D to fly around as if you're kind of in a first-person shooter. Now, if we continue down from the other preferences, we have resize top and bottom viewports together. If we switch this off, we can do this. So notice how I've got kind of a, a almost Z-shaped uh, breakup of our our windows here. Now if I come back down to our preferences and I turn on resize top and bottom together, now they always line up. That's all there is to it. Now the last couple of things we have here are drag moves the canvas. If you come over to an orthographic view, if I click with the left mouse button and drag, I'm just dragging that view around. So you can see a little tiny hand like it's grabbing the, the grid and just kind of moving it exactly where the mouse goes. That's one form of navigation. Now alternatively, if you turn off drag moves canvas, the whole view is going to move in the direction you move your mouse. So it's really just whichever method you prefer. The non-drag method is kind of the old school uh, Unreal navigation system. And then finally we have center zoom along uh, around the cursor. This is really for the mouse wheel. Now I've just switched it off and if I mouse wheel in, you'll notice that I'm zooming in right toward the center of the view. However, if we come back in and turn that back on, I could put the cursor, say, over here in the lower right corner of the top view, and now we're zooming toward that area. So it's really just about using that mouse wheel and zooming in and out. So that is a look at the various options of the view menu. Again, a lot of these you probably won't be able to really uh, wrap your head around too much until you use UDK and start using these individual aspects of the editor but that will wrap things up for this video. Let's take a look at the brush menu. Now, if you open up the brush menu, your first four options are CSG add, subtract, intersect, and de-intersect. These are all commands that operate on the Red Builder brush. So what I'm gonna do is here I am inside of a brand new additive level. In fact, if you wanna follow along, you just go to File, New, choose Additive, and click OK. Now, what I'm gonna do here is just with the basic Red Builder brush, which is a 256 unit cube, I'm just going to come over here to brush and choose CSG add. And what that just did is that added some geometry into our world in the shape of whatever the red builder brush happened to be. So if I take the red builder brush and let's just grab this say in the top view and I'll slide it off to the right and we'll just kind of position our perspective camera accordingly. Now if I come back and do it again, we just go to brush add, we add a second brush. That's all this is for. It's just going to take the Red Builder brush, use it as a template, and add that geometry into the world. Now conversely, the subtract option is going to do just the opposite. So let's position the Red Builder brush so it kind of intersects these two brushes. And then we'll just simply go to brush, CSG, subtract, and you see that chops that surface away. Now in effect, what's happening, if I come over here to one of the side views, in fact, let's take a look here at the front view we are actually creating different brushes. We have the Red Builder brush here shown in red. In fact, let's make this view nice and big so everybody can see it. We have our Red Builder brush currently selected. We have two additive brushes and we have our subtractive brush which is being used to chop away the additive surface of our additive brushes. And you can see the result here inside perspective. So pretty straightforward. It's just here to help you create BSP geometry for your levels. That's really the big reason it's here. This is what you will use to rough in the basic shapes of your level. You'll then put textures or materials on, on these surfaces and then decorate them with static meshes. Now there's a couple of other options for CSG. We have intersect and de-intersect. And these are ways to change the shape of the Red Builder brush. So what I'm going to do is take the Red Builder brush and I'm going to place it so that it just kind of crosses over the corner of this additive brush here in our side view. 
And now I'll simply come over to view. I'm sorry, not view. Let's go to brush and just choose intersect. And wherever that brush intersected with the additive brush, all we get is that result. So it's kind of like a Boolean operation. Now, if I reset that back just by left-clicking on the cube button, we can try it again. Now, this time, I'm just going to go over to brush and choose de-intersect. And it grabs everything but the area where those two brushes were intersecting each other. It's just a way for you to get some custom BSP brush shapes in your Red Builder brush based on surrounding geometry. However, this can tend to create... BSP geometry that's a little bit more complicated than what you want. As a general rule, you want these brushes to be as simple as you can possibly make them and then use things like static meshes to actually create any uh, decorative elements. Just food for thought. Now, moving along, let's go ahead and put that back to its cube by clicking on the cube button. And continuing down the brush menu, we have Add Special. This is going to open up a window, which is here kind of as a legacy issue. The big important options you have in here are, are your solidity options for solid brushes, semi-solid, and non-solid. A solid brush is just your basic brush. It means that as a player runs into it, it's going to stop the player. It's going to stop any projectiles that move through it. A semi-solid brush is going to do the same thing. However, it's not going to create any extra BSP cuts in your geometry. Now, that could sound a little bit confusing if you're not used to working with the editor. So I'm going to take just a moment and create a quick example. So I'm going to delete out these additive and subtractive brushes, and I'll click the Build Geometry for Current Level button, or alternatively, I could come over to the Build menu, which we haven't really discussed just yet, and just click on Geometry for Current Level. Now, what that did, as well as bring up this kind of window here, was get rid of that extra geometry. So I'm just going to start kind of like a fresh start, just to demonstrate this. Let's right-click on our Cube button. Now, that's located here on the left-hand side in our toolbox. You'll notice it's just a little cube icon. And we're going to set up some numbers here. I'm going to take X and set it to 1024. I'll press the down arrow key. We'll take Y and set that to 1024 as well. And then we'll take Z and we'll set this to 32. If I click Build and Close, you'll notice my Red Builder brush is now in the shape of a great big platform. Now let's go back up to the Brush menu and choose CSG Add. So that adds in this great big platform. As a matter of fact, if I wanted to, I could have a character running around on this. I just wouldn't be able to see much because there are currently no lights in the scene. Now, let's go back into the settings for our cube brush. I'm going to right-click on the cube button on the left-hand side of the screen one more time. And this time, we're going to set everything back to the way it was. So let's do 256, press the down arrow key, 256, and then 256 again. So that just creates a nice little box for us. So we'll close that. Now, I'm going to position the Red Builder brush so that it sits right on top of this platform using the orthographic view here. And there we go. We can take a look at the edges and see that they're touching each other exactly, which is just what we want. Now, I'm going to start off by setting our solidity to solid. And we'll go ahead and click OK. Actually, before I even do that... No, OK. No, I'm sorry. Let's just go ahead and do that. So I'll click OK. Now... I'm going to switch modes here in my view mode. Currently, I'm in unlit mode, which just allows me to see what's going on without having to create any lights. I'm going to switch over to wireframe mode, and I'll move the Red Builder brush out of the way. Now, take a look at what we've got here. The ge this is the geometry that was actually produced by the engine that our character will interact with while they're playing around. So you can see where there's some triangles cut where the two pieces merge into each other. As a matter of fact, just to kind of illustrate the point, here in the side view, I'm going to select our little cube brush we just built and move it just slightly into the air. And if I come over to my build options and rebuild the geometry, look at how simple that geometry just got. It's just two great big triangles because the system doesn't have to make any special cuts to make way for this new piece of geometry. The two pieces of geometry are no longer connected. If I put them back together so that they're touching and rebuild one more time, notice how the surface got a lot more complicated to make way for these new vertices. So you see how that kind of works. Now, what I'm going to do is delete this additive brush. I'm just going to hit the delete key. And now it's gone, and I need to rebuild my geometry for the effect to completely disappear. So we'll go back to build and choose geometry for current level. So now we're back to this very simple platform. Now, let's take our red builder brush back in the front view again. And I'm going to set it right back on top of our platform, right where it was. This time under build special, We'll go under Brush, Add Special. We'll choose a semi-solid. And when I click OK, 
take a look at the difference. The two brushes are touching, but it didn't create any excess cuts in the geometry. So it kept both things very simple. Now, uh, earlier in the video, I mentioned that this was really here as legacy support. In much earlier versions of Unreal Engine 3, you could use brushes to handle things like creating stairways, and it was a little more beneficial to do things like that, or columns, or, or special decorations, with semi-solid brushes so that you weren't creating a whole lot of excess vertices in your geometry. However, these days it's really better off if you're creating static meshes for that sort of thing. So you'd want to bring in a separately modeled static mesh model for things like stairways or columns or whatnot, but the functionality is still here. Now let's go ahead and move the red builder brush out of the way. And finally, if we go back under our brush menu and go back to add special just one more time, we have non-solid. This is kind of like a holographic brush. Not only does it not create any extra vertices in our BSP surface, but also a player or a projectile will just pass right through it as if it were a hologram. Now I'm going to go to file and choose new just to wipe out our scene and we don't need to save any changes. And if we continue down the brush menu, we have a couple of other options. We have add volume, and this gives us access to all of the different types of volumes we can add. Volumes are really kind of a topic unto themselves. What a volume is, is an area designated by the shape of your BSP brush, such that when the player enters that volume, when they enter that space, something will happen. You can change the physics so that gravity is different. You can change the post-process effect to maybe change the colors of the screen. You can change how sounds work. You can stream levels in. A lot of different functionality and a lot of different types of volumes you can use just to handle that sort of stuff. Now down from here we have import and export. This allows you to import and export 3D models to use as brushes. So for instance we could go to import and I've got a little uh, ASE file that I created inside of 3ds Max. It's just a, a simple tall block. So we can open that up and I'll choose merge faces and leave it as a solid mesh. Click OK and now if I click on my red builder brush there's that model exactly how it looked inside of 3ds Max brought in as a brush. So very straightforward. So there is a look at the brush menu. The four big players in here are probably going to be your add, subtract, intersect, and de-intersect. You'll also be using add volume a bit. However, I must admit, I don't think I ever really come up to this menu because all of this exact same functionality exists here on the left side of your screen in your toolbox, and I find myself using this a lot more often. So that will wrap things up for this video. The primary function of the build menu is really for calculating things like geometry and lighting and navigation paths in your level. To give a good example of this, I'm going to set up a couple of simple BSP brushes and a light source. So here inside this level, I'm going to jump over to the left hand side of the screen and grab the cube button over here in the toolbox. I'm going to right click on this button and inside the properties window, let's set X to 1024. We'll set Y to 1024 as well and we'll set Z to 32. I'll click build and close. Now let's add this into the level. So I'm just going to go to, to brush and choose add. And now if we come into an unlit view, we can actually see the platform that that created. Now if we look at this in lit mode by clicking the lit button here inside the perspective view, everything is pretty much black. So I'm going to add a light now. There's a couple of different ways to do this, but as a shortcut, I'm going to hold down the L key and just left click here on the surface and that creates a light. Now using the translation widget, I can just slide this light up into the air. Now let's say that I decided that floor was just in the wrong location. So I'm going to move my red builder brush out of the way. And let's say I take that floor and I move it up a little bit so it's away from the light. You can see the brush has moved, but the actual floor surface has not. That's because we need to recalculate where that geometry is being built. So we need to go under the build menu and choose geometry for current level. This will rebuild the geometry for the current level. You can also rebuild geometry for visible levels if you have level streaming and several levels are visible right now. So if we click geometry for current level, it takes a second and calculates. We get a couple of warnings that we can ignore for the time being and our platform has actually moved over here. So now I could potentially slide my light over here. Now admittedly I don't think I ever use the build option inside this menu because there's also a button analogous to it over here inside the main toolbar. You'll see it listed as a little tiny cube and it says build geometry for current level. So all that's doing is recalculating any changes you've made to your BSP brushes and it constructs your geometry for the level. That's all there is to it. Now moving down we have build lighting 
if we were to try to play this level right now, I'm just going to right click here on this platform and choose play from here. We get this dark, spooky kind of environment. I can shoot my weapon and we can see that there's a floor underneath me, but we can't really see anything else. It's because our lighting needs to be rebuilt. As a matter of fact, if we take a look in the upper left corner of the window, it actually says the lighting needs to be rebuilt. It gives you a nice warning. So let's come under build and choose lighting. And this is going to give us some options as to what we want to build. Uh, for now, let's leave it at the defaults. It asks you where you want to build lighting for maybe only selected objects or only for the current level. What quality do you want? Would you like to use light mass, etc.? Let's go ahead and just leave everything just the way it is and click OK. Now, this will take just a moment because there are several things taking place here. Uh, swarm has got to fire up. Light mass has got to be engaged. We're going to get a couple of warning menus, but overall, it's fairly quick. However, now, if we right-click and choose play from here we can see the floor. So what that build lighting option did was it created our pre-baked lighting for the level. So now we can actually see what's going on, which of course is going to be important. You can also build the AI paths. If you place any path nodes or pylons to create navigation meshes to move your AI bots around in your level, you can have all those get recalculated in case you've moved some stuff around. Next, we can build all. So if you don't want to choose an individual part, you just want to build everything, you can just click this and that'll take care of it. And then you can choose to play the level either right here inside the editor, which we just did a second ago, or on a PC, which will open up a separate uh, launch of the actual game and you can see what it looks like. Though these will require that a player start be placed in your level. So that's going to be everything for the build menu. Thanks a lot. All right, the tools menu is very simple. Of particular note in here is the new terrain wizard, which is a very easy way to create a new terrain. It'll just ask you some basic questions as to where you want the terrain and how big you want it. And as you click next, it'll build that terrain for you. Also, you have the check map for errors window. So you can look and see if you have any primary problems in here you need to take care of, such as you know your kill Z may need to be set or rebuild your paths. Anything that you ought to look into is going to be listed right here inside your map check. Now there's some other things here as well, uh, such as cleaning up your BSP materials to make sure you don't have any stray materials on surfaces that are touching each other, uh, replacing your skeletal mesh actors, and regenerating any procedural buildings you have. But generally, these are all very specialized options that you'll only need in very specific circumstances. So that's a quick look at the tools menu. Thanks. All right, so let's take a look at the help menu. Now, if you're watching this video, then I'm going to go out on a limb and say that you're probably a visual person and not the kind of person who really wants to hear, you know, go read the help file. And I totally understand. I'm often the same way. Though, if you're so inclined, we have online help, which is going to take you to the UDN page about UDK. And so here it is. You can search for anything you might happen to be looking for. It's a great resource, so be sure to check that out. You can also just ask in the forums and see if there's anybody else out there who can help you with a problem. Now, if you go down from here, you have setting up Swarm, which is such an important topic that it has its own entry in the help file, so you don't have to go looking around on the UDN to find it. This shows you how you can set up Swarm to distribute out your building. Like if you're building a light system, you don't have to do it right here on just one computer. You can use multiple computers to get that done, which is very, very convenient and can really speed up the process. And it'll walk you through actually setting all that up. Next, we have the tip of the day, which you can just cycle through all these tips, take a look at them. You know, really, I would highly recommend you take a moment and just read through these. There's some really nice information buried in these. I think uh, every now and then I do come across one of these that I haven't read, though I don't cycle through them all because it, to me that's just kind of like ruining the surprise. And then uh, we have the about page, which at first glance you might, oh, well, who would ever look at the about page? But really, aside from the really cool graphic, at the bottom it has your engine version, which can be important, as well as your change list, just so that you know exactly which version of UDK you're using. So that about wraps it up for the help. Let's take a look at the main menu bar. Now this rests right here underneath the main menu bar. It's just a big, long, horizontal strip of buttons. And what I'm going to do is talk about these buttons in groups, because most of them are pretty simple. Some of them require a little bit of explanation. But just to keep things moving nice and steady, we'll just grab the really simple ones and group them all together. The first several are very straightforward, and they, most of them come right out of the file and edit menu. We have create a new map, open an existing map. It's pretty obvious what those do. Then we have a little tiny drop down here. This includes all of our recently opened maps if you want to open anything up. Now next to this, we can save our map. So if you make any changes and want to save, just click on the little save icon and save all levels if you're using level streaming and you have several different maps or several different levels open at the same time. You can save them all simultaneously. Now next to this, you have undo and redo. 
So if you can just reach up here and click on these. And of course, redo won't really be functional until you've undone something. So that's the first several buttons. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and end the video here, and then we'll move on and talk about some of the widget controls in the next video. The next group of buttons I want to talk about inside the main toolbar here allow us to control our transformation widgets. So I'm just going to demonstrate this here inside of a new additive level. Let me go ahead and maximize the viewport. And if I select the red builder brush, we see the translation widget available right here in the center of the brush. And this allows us to move the object around. I can move it along the X axis, which is red, the Y axis, which is green, or the Z axis, which is blue and allows us to move up and down. I can also move along two separate axes at the same time if I select the little planes in between each one of those arrows. Now, up here inside the main toolbar, I can jump between the different transformation widgets available. So what you see there is the translation widget. We can switch over to rotation mode as well, and then we get three axes about which we can rotate the object. So here's rotating in X, here's rotating in Y, and here's rotating in Z. Then we can jump over to scaling mode, and this allows us to scale the object up and down. Now scaling mode is for uniform scaling. If you want to do non-uniform scaling, you can switch over to non-uniform scaling mode, which will allow you to scale in just one axis. So you can stretch a brush out. And this is not just for brushes, this also works for static meshes. I'm just demonstrating it on a brush for simplicity's sake. Now on the far left hand side you also have selection mode and what this does is this makes it so that objects cannot be translated rotated or scaled it's just kind of a way to keep you from accidentally nudging something so it's kind of a way to turn off those transformation widgets so that you don't accidentally change anything now you also can change the reference coordinate system for your operations and this is something that you might have seen you know if you're using a 3D applications such as 3ds Max or even when using Maya but what I'm gonna do to really kind of show it off here is let's open up a map so I'm just gonna grab sandstorm real quick and we don't need to save any changes here and let's fly over and let's grab let's just pick on this static mesh right here this nice dome static mesh now currently if I grab my translation widget it says I am in local as far as my reference coordinate system is concerned. And you'll see there's two options here. There's local and there's world. So let's leave it in local for a minute and I'll just move the mesh over here and then I'm gonna rotate it. Now, earlier I clicked on the rotation mode button. You can also just tap the space bar and that'll cycle through your different modes. So now we'll rotate this a little bit, say like so. Now, if I switch back to translation, take a look at the translation widget. It's now angled to orient itself along with the object. That's because we are in local mode. If I switch the reference coordinate system over to world, that widget will align itself with the world coordinates. So if we want to keep moving it in world space, we can choose world. However, if we want to kind of slide it along its own rotation, switch over to local, and we can do that. So that's a, a quick look at our transformation options here inside the main toolbar, and that will wrap up this video. The next button along our main toolbar is the Find Actors button. And this opens up the Search for Actors window, which is kind of like an integrated search engine allowing you to quickly find any actor that you've placed inside your level using its name. Now, if we start off a search, just as an example, for light, what we're going to get is the result of searching for the word light as the starting object. So in this case, we're starting with the word light. We can also switch to containing, and we'll grab any object whose name contains light. Now we don't have to just search for name. If we grab the drop down here, we can search the uh, level, so what level it happens to be in any group, its path name, its tag. And you can see all of that information broken down here inside the list of results. So for instance, we could grab point light 12, and once we've made a selection, we can delete the object if we want to, which I'm not gonna do in this case. We can open up its properties if we want to make any changes to it. So I could maybe come into the lights properties and maybe change its radius or change its color, for instance. Or I can go right to that object if I need to know where it is. Now, I'm going to kind of slide the window up here and out of the way. We can see the light over here on the right-hand side of the screen. But if I click Go To, it's going to jump the viewport right over to it. Now, occasionally, depending on the layout of your level, you'll click Go To, and Go To is just going to move the camera. It's not going to rotate the camera around, so sometimes you might be behind a wall or stuck inside of a static mesh when you actually jump to an object. A quick workaround, if you uh, can kind of train your brain to use it, if that ever happens, let's say maybe we 
we click go to and let's make sure I have the proper light selected. So let's grab 12 and click go to again. And now check it out. We get nothing because I'm on the far side of the wall. If this happens, hold down the L key, which activates your Maya style uh, rotation for your camera. And then just drag with the left mouse button and you can tumble around that object. So it's just a, a quick trick that might help you out if you ever get stuck behind an object when using go to. And then finally, of course, you can close the window. So that's just a quick rundown of search for actors. It's again, just a way for you to be able to find any actor that you've placed in your level through a variety of search criteria. And that will wrap things up for this video. Moving on down the main toolbar, the next button I want to talk about is the open content browser button. If you click on this, it brings up the content browser. Very straightforward. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about what the content browser does. Really, it warrants its own videos. There's all sorts of cool things you can do here inside the content browser. But in short, this is where you're going to get any exterior assets to place in your level. Things like static meshes, particle systems, materials, anything that's not already a coded part of the interface is all accessible right here inside the content browser. And there's a lot of really cool functionality in here. As you build your levels, you'll be using this a lot. So you'll probably reach up here and click on this open content browser button a lot. Now, next to this, we have the open Unreal Kismet button. Clicking on this will open up the Kismet editor. And Kismet is simply a visual scripting system that is a part of Unreal Engine 3. It allows artists, people who are not frequently sitting down and creating programs, to create their own game scripts to control in-game actions. You can designate certain events, such as when the level loads, or when a player hits a trigger, a variety of different things, and you can have actions take place in response to those events. Now, Kismet is also one of those topics that really warrants its entire uh, set of videos, so I'm not going to talk too much more about it here. Just to show you that by clicking on the Unreal Kismet button here inside our main toolbar, we can open up the editor. Next, we have the Open Unreal Matinee button. Now, this is going to work differently depending on how many, if any at all, matinee sequences you have in your level. If you have no matinee sequences, this button won't do anything. If you have one, this will automatically open up the one matinee se uh, sequence that you have. If you have several, as we do here inside of VCTF Sandstorm, it'll give you a drop down of all of the different matinee sequences available. You can choose one, and it'll open up the matinee for that sequence. Now I'll go ahead and close this. And the last thing I want to talk about is our distance to far clipping plane slider. Now to really show this off, I'm going to maximize the viewport. Now I'm in game mode, so things look really nice right now. And what I'm going to do is just take that slider and start to slide it back off to the left and take a look out there in the distance. There's kind of this wall that is moving forward, devouring everything in the distance as it gets closer. This is just a way for you to cut off anything kind of beyond a certain distance. It can help in performance and it can help kind of get rid of distractions. For instance, if we know we kind of want to work right here in this general area and everything taking place out there in the distance is just a distraction, then we can pull our clipping plane back a little bit to just focus on this area. Or if we want to see more, we can slide the clipping plane away. So it's just a way to cut off anything that's really far away from the camera. So that's a quick look at the next few buttons. Again, we've got the open content browser, open Unreal Kismet, open matinee, as well as the clipping plane slider. All right, so the next several buttons here along our main toolbar are very specific. They include allow translucent selection, toggle brush polygons, lock prefabs from selection, enable or disable socket snapping, and particle system using LODs in the perspective viewport, which is a really long tooltip. Now, what I'm going to do is give you a demonstration of each one of these using VCTF Sandstorm. So if you'd like, you can go ahead and go to File and open that up. Now, the first one, which is toggling translucent selection, I'm going to demonstrate this by coming over here underneath this little bridge covered area, and I'm going to open up the content browser. Now, here inside the content browser, let's do a very particular search. So make sure you've clicked the All Assets button, and then here inside the search line for your filter, I want you to do a couple of things. First off, let's search for light. And then let's narrow this down by clicking on only static meshes. So check little static mesh checkbox. If you scroll down here to the bottom, you're going to see a couple of volumetric static meshes, kind of for spotlights and volumetric lighting. Grab either one of these two. It doesn't really matter which one. I'm going to grab the little skinny one on the right-hand side. I'm going to slide my content browser off to the right, so it's mostly off the screen but just so I can see the underside of this bridge. Then I'll just drag this little light mesh right here to the underside of the bridge, 
and boom, there you go. You get a nice little volumetric light effect, which doesn't have a light source right now. This is just here kind of as a demonstration. Now let's close this. Now currently I have my scale widget available. If you don't have that available, tap the space bar until it cycles around. So boom, there you go. That's what you want. Now I'm going to scale this up. It looks kind of like uh, something that should be coming out of the underside of an alien ship when you scale it up like that. Now what I want you to do is make sure that allow translucent selection is off. And then I want you to click right here in this light source and see what we get. You'll notice that we're actually selecting the static mesh on the far side of that volumetric light. Now if we switch it on, I'm actually selecting the light cone itself. So it's really just a question of do you want to be able to select volumetric effects or translucent objects like this volumetric light cone. So that one's pretty easy and it's very specialized. You're not always going to need it, but man, when you need it, it's very, very handy. Now next, we have toggle brush polygons. If I fly out here to these great big blocking volumes that kind of surround our level, if I select one of these, you'll notice that right now all we really get is the wireframe of that brush, but if I switch on toggle brush polygons, the polys of that brush will become shaded in, which can make it just a little bit easier to see what's going on. Now, moving across, we have lock prefabs from selection. To really drive this home and make it make sense, we need to create a prefab. So I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to tap the O key, which will get rid of any volumes in our level just so that they're not visible. It just keeps those blocking volumes from kind of cluttering up our view. Now, let's take a look at this cool, kind of almost Grim Reaper-ish sort of character, this statue. You will notice that he's actually made of several different static meshes. So there's like this wing, there's the statue itself, there are these hoses that are hanging down. I'm just holding down control and clicking on each one of these. We also have the pedestal down here at the bottom. Now, let's say, just for the sake of argument, that we wanted all of these objects to be considered as a single object for placement, uh, if we wanted to move them around, make duplicates of them, and so on and so forth. We can create a prefab of these objects. So what I'm going to do is right-click and come down to Create Prefab. Now it's going to ask for some information. It wants to know what package to save this in, so I'm going to make just kind of a temporary package. We'll call this temp underscore prefab package, which I'll just get rid of later. For the group, we'll just say prefabs. And for the name, we'll do cool Grim Reaper statue. There we go. Now we click OK and we're going to get another message that says, would you like to replace these actors with an instance of the new prefab? Why yes, yes I would. So we click yes. Our static meshes are now gone and we now have a prefab. So now we, if we select any one of these, currently we can actually still select the static meshes. If we click lock prefabs from selection, however, selecting any one of these objects will select all of them simultaneously. So it's just a question of whether or not you want to be able to select the individual parts of a prefab or the entire prefab as a whole. Now, if we switch out of game mode, and if I navigate here inside the base of this mesh, we also get a little prefab icon. Even if we don't have lock prefabs from selection on, we can always grab the entire prefab by grabbing this icon. So just keep that in mind. Now, next to this, we have Enable or Disable Socket Snapping. And this is a really cool one, very handy once you know that it's there and how to use it. I'm going to come down here to this little shaded area, just because it's a little easier to see. And let's see here, I'm going to tap the O key to get rid of those volumes again. And let's come over to our content browser. This time, I'm going to clear out everything in my search line. So just go ahead and click the clear button. Make sure again that you are looking within all assets. And I want you to click the skeletal meshes checkbox. Now this will give you a big list of all the skeletal meshes included with UDK. Let's grab the SKCH Iron Guard Male A skeletal mesh. So let's just select this guy. And let's just drag and drop him right here onto the ground. Now when he comes in, by default, he's kind of sticking halfway through the ground, so I'm going to tap spacebar to get my translation widget, and we'll pick him up into the air. He doesn't necessarily have to be sitting right on the ground. I mean, if he's hovering right above it, that's okay. No big deal. Now, let's say we wanted to give this guy a gun. He, let's say he's a skeletal mesh that we're going to be animating in matinee, but for our animation, he has to be holding a weapon. Well, here's the thing. A weapon, in this case, let's just pick on a shock rifle. So here's our shock rifle. It's SKWP Shock Rifle 3P. The 3P stands for third person. You don't want to use the first person model. So I'll grab the 3P version, and I'm just going to drag that onto the ground right next to our guy. 
how do we get our skeletal mesh, this guy, to hold on to the shock rifle? You could spend a while trying to position and get things lined up, but then you need to attach it, and there's a lot of different steps you'd have to take. Fortunately, socket snapping deals with the problem for us. If we switch on socket snapping, all of the sockets of our skeletal meshes suddenly become active. All we have to do is select our shock rifle and then click where we want it to go. So let's click on the socket right here next to our little guy's right hand and boom, check it out. The shock rifle jumps right into his hand. It's already attached. And if we were to animate this skeletal mesh at this point, the shock rifle would move along as if he were actually holding it. So it's a real quick and easy way to deal with the problem of getting an, a character to have some object attached to a socket. Now, the last one of these little specialized buttons is the select to have particle system use distance LOD in the perspective viewport. That's a really awesomely long tooltip. Now, to show this off, I'm going to fly the camera way out here into this little kind of no man's land where players aren't supposed to go. Now, let's go back into the content browser. Let's go ahead and clear out all of our search criteria and make sure we are searching for all assets. So click the all assets button. And I want you to search for particle systems. So check the particle systems box. Then in the search line, I want you to type in something very particular. Type in shock, which is for shock rifle. And I want you to grab the P underscore WP underscore shock rifle underscore ball particle system. I'm going to take this guy and just drag and drop him right here onto this kind of slanted piece of ground. Now he's kind of sticking halfway through the ground, which is no fun whatsoever. So using the translation widget, I'll just pick him up a little bit. Now there's all sorts of stuff kind of getting in the way of us really being able to see this guy. So I'm going to make sure we are in game mode, which will kind of get some of the icons out of the way. Also though, I'm going to switch on real time, which gives us the kind of animated effect. Now back in the content browser, real quick, if we double click on this particle system, we get Unreal Cascade, which I'm not going to talk about too much right here, save at the very top, we have these controls that look kind of like controls on a DVD player for, you know, jumping and fast forwarding, skipping to different chapters. These allow us to cycle through our different levels of detail. We also have a preview window here on the right. Now what I'm going to do, I'm just going to walk you through it. I'm going to use the right mouse button here inside the preview window and drag forward to get us really close to this particle system. Up here inside the toolbar, there's a button over on the right hand side labeled jump to lower LOD level. If I click on that, it takes us to the lower LOD level. LOD levels, uh, LOD is short for level of detail. This allows us to simplify our particle system if we're really far away from it. And in this particular case, if I jump back, we have our high detailed version. And if we're really far away, we don't really necessarily need to see a lot of these extra effects. So we have a simpler version that will just keep things nice and uh, easily calculable if we're really far away. So let's close out Cascade. I just wanted to show off that we do have two levels of detail on that particle system, and we'll close the content browser. Now, what I'm going to do is put us right on top of this particle system. In fact, let me slow down my camera real quick. And if we look right on top of this guy, we can actually see the high-res version. Now, I just switched on the select to have particle system use LODs in the perspective viewport button. Now check this out. I'm holding down the right mouse button and I'm going to fly us away from this guy. So we're really far away. He's just kind of a speck in the distance. Now I'm going to zoom back in, still holding the right mouse button. I'm going to press the C key. See, he's lost those little dark rings. As I start to move closer to him, boom, you see him pop right into existence and then pop out. There you go. So it's just a way that you can preview those levels of detail. So very, very handy. Also shows a, a nice way to use the zoom feature on your camera as well. So that's a quick walk through the allow translucent selection, toggle brush polygons, lock prefabs from selection, enable and disable, excuse me, enable and disable socket snapping, and then finally our particle system LOD preview button. So that's going to wrap things up for this video. Thanks a lot. Okay, let's wrap up the main toolbar and take a look at these last few buttons. Now, this starts off with the Build Geometry for Current Level button. And this is really all about just recalculating any BSP geometry that you've put in place. So, for instance, here's my red builder brush. I'm going to come over to the toolbox on the left-hand side of the screen. And about halfway down, you'll see the CSG Add button on the left side. I'm going to click that. 
Now, let me also switch my perspective viewport over into unlit mode so that we can see the result. And I'll get my red builder brush nice and out of the way. So here we can see the solid geometry formed from an additive brush. But here's the cool thing. If I take this additive brush and I move it, notice that the solid geometry doesn't actually update. In order to get this to update, I simply need to rebuild my geometry, which is where this build geometry for current level button comes in. I click that recalculates. It also checks the map for any errors, which for the time being we can ignore, but we can see that the solid geometry now lines back up with our additive brush. Very, very straightforward. Now next to this we have build lighting. Currently this won't do me any good because I don't have any lights in the scene. So I'm going to do a couple of things. Let's take this brush and I'm going to nuke it. Just hit delete and make it go away. Now the red builder brush. Let's make this a little bigger. In the toolbox on the left hand side, kind of near the top, we have the cube button. Go ahead and right click on that, and inside the Brush Builder Cube settings, we're going to punch in 1024 for X, 1024 for Y, and 32 for Z, just to kind of build a great big platform. Now once again, I'm going to click the CSG Add button, which adds a nice platform that we could potentially run around on. Now I'm going to hold down the L key and left click right here in the middle of this platform, which creates a light. Currently, we don't really see the result of that, though, until we switch our viewport over to lit mode, and then we can lift our light up into the air with the translation widget. Now, this lighting has not yet been baked into the surfaces of our level, meaning that if we tried to right-click here on the surface and choose play from here, we just get a black scene. Nothing's actually going on here. I can shoot and see a little bit of light, but outside of that, there is nothing. We need to calculate our lighting by clicking the Build Lighting button. This will give us an options window, which will allow us to choose what we want to build for. Do we want to build on the BSP, any static meshes? We can also build only on selected objects, which is very handy, or just for the current level. Or, also, or build only for levels selected in the level browser. We can choose the overall quality, from preview all the way up to production quality. We can choose to use light mass, which of course we're going to leave on. And we can use error coloring. So if there's any sort of errors, these will actually be color coded. Now, let's just go ahead and click OK real quick. This will take just a minute. We will get an error because we're not using a light mass importance volume, which light mass is kind of expecting. But overall, that was really fast. So we'll close that out. Now if I right click here on the floor and choose play from here, we can actually see the floor because that lighting has been calculated. Any changes that I was to make to this light, if I moved the light, if I changed its color, or if I moved any of the static objects influencing the light. For instance, if I had a static mesh here that was casting a shadow, if I was to move that static mesh, that changes the result of the lighting. In those cases, I would need to recalculate my lighting. So do keep in that sort of stuff in mind. Now next we have build paths. This will allow us to recalculate any AI navigation systems such as bot paths or any pylons and navigation meshes that have been placed in our level. We can build cover nodes. Now, if you've played the game Gears of War, and hopefully you have, then you saw the result of the cover node system. It's what allows uh, players and AI bots to know where they can take cover behind certain objects. And those are all linked in their own little navigation network, so you can rebuild those as well. Now, moving on, we have the Build All button. This will build our geometry, it'll build our lighting, and build any AI paths all in one go. So you don't have to choose which one to build. Now honestly, this is the one I use more often than not. Next, we can choose our lighting quality settings. Now if you left click on this, you're cycling through your different levels, with the little I being preview quality, then there's a little letter M for medium, then high, then production. If you right click on this, you can choose in a drop down style which one you want to use. I'd recommend staying on preview for as long as you can. Now, next we have full screen mode. If you click on this, UDK will take up every spare pixel it can on your monitor. It'll get rid of the little Windows bar up at the very top, and if you have a start bar visible, which I do, it's just outside the capture region, uh, then that would go away as well. Now, our last two buttons are start this level on the PC and play this level in the editor. Now, what I'm going to do is go to File, Open, and let's open up VCTF Sandstorm. I'm going to show these two off, but I'm going to start with the one on the very end. So we'll start off with play this level in the editor. I'm just going to click here. Now, clicking these, uh, as she gets done talking, clicking these does require that you have a player start in your level. So if you haven't right-clicked, gone down to add actor, and chose a player start, you won't actually be able to use these. But I am playing around 
inside the editor. I can run all the way through the game. But here's the thing. If I press F1, you'll notice that I'm the only player here. I'm all by myself. So finally, we have found a version of Capture the Flag that I can win. Anyway, let's go ahead and hit Escape and jump out of the in-editor game. If we click on Start this level on the PC, we're going to get a little save window, and I don't want to save any of this, so no to all. And what this will do is this will actually launch the game in a completely separate individual instance of Unreal Engine 3. You get the little Unreal Technology window, and this is the full game. So we're actually ready to go here. As soon as this gets done loading up, we can click, press fire to start. This is just like playing UT3. 3, 2, 1, play. And now I'm running around. And if I hit F1, there are other bots in here with me. So they're already duking it out down here, they're getting in vehicles, they're shooting at me, and they're, they're killing me already. Because that's how good I am at this game. So now if we hit escape, you'll see there's our score, and we can just click exit game and get out of there. So if you really want to see how the overall game is playing with all the bells and whistles, then just load up play on the PC. So that is a look at the remaining buttons of our main toolbar that wraps up our discussion of the main toolbar's functionality and wraps up this video. Thanks a lot. Let's shift our attention over to the toolbox, which is this vertical strip of buttons that sits on the left-hand side of your UDK interface. Now the toolbox is broken up into a series of collapsible subsections. So if you click on the little tiny black triangles located in each one of these sections, you can collapse them down if you just need to clear up some room. Though at the default resolution, which is 1280 by 1024 for UDK, it's not going to take up the whole strip anyway. So you should be good to go there. Now, what do these sections do? Let's just kind of keep things very high level, at least for starters. We have the mode area, which allows us to change the mode that UDK is in. We have the primitives area, which allows us to change the red builder brush into a variety of different shapes to create geometry for our level. We have our CSG area, which allows us to create additive and subtractive brushes, as well as intersect and de-intersect the red builder brush. We have the special air and volume area, which is what I'm just going to kind of designate it. It allows us to add special brushes, which are more of a legacy issue than anything you'll probably find yourself using very often, as well as the add volume button where you can create all of the different types of volumes for your level. And then finally, we have a visibility area. Now, what I'm going to do just in this video is just focus kind of on the mode area and give you sort of a, a higher level description of what each one of these modes are for. And then as we move through different videos, we'll kind of take a look at each one of the different uh, sections of buttons underneath that. So up here at the very top, we have camera mode, which is your default mode for UDK. Now, just to kind of show it off, I come over here to file, open, and let's just grab, say, VCTF Necropolis. Once this loads in, currently we are in camera mode, which is where you spend most of your time in UDK. It just means that we're just moving around, uh, manipulating objects, kind of doing the, the general routine. Now, geometry mode is a little different. Geometry mode is right next door to camera mode. If you click on that, you're going to get the geometry tools window. And this allows you to select a BSP brush and edit it as if you were looking at a modeling package. And actually, to make this a little bit easier to see, let's just go to File, New, and we'll just do a new additive level. And the reason we're doing that is that means we'll just have a little red builder brush to look at. And I'm going to maximize the perspective viewport just so that things are nice and big. Now, I'm still in geometry mode. So if I click on the red builder brush, You'll notice the polygons of the brush actually get shaded a bit, and the vertices of the brush become highlighted. So we can click on one of these vertices, and we can now move it around, thereby changing the shape of the brush a bit. Uh, we can grab an edge, or in this case I grabbed a polygon, and we can move the polygon. If we click very carefully right on an edge... We can also select and manipulate edges as well. Now, geometry mode is one of those things that you could spend an uh, entire section of videos just covering, and that's what we're going to do. So I'm not going to go too much further into it here. For now, let me just go ahead and reset this back to its standard cube, and we'll move on to terrain editing mode. Now, terrain editing mode is really only useful if you have a terrain. So let's go to file, and let's open up a new level. No, let's grab VCTF Sandstorm. Sandstorm's got a, a big batch of terrain all across the floor, being the sandy stuff here. Now what I'm going to do is jump into terrain editing mode. 
Now, this gives you a wide variety of terrain tools that allow you to control the texture that is placed on a terrain, the elevation at any given area, and it's a brush-based system, meaning you can paint different layers of elevation, you can paint different textures right onto the surface, and again, it's one of those things that's kind of worthy of its own set of videos, but just as a quick demonstration, I'm going to come in here and grab the paint tool from the tools group. I'm going to take my radius and kick that up to somewhere around maybe 300 something. This is close to 400, but that's okay. We'll give it a little bit of fall off as well, and I'm going to slide the terrain editing uh, window kind of out of the way. Now take a look here inside the viewport. You'll see that my cursor is this great big circular thing. Now if I hold down the control key and I left drag, so dragging with the left mouse button, you see I can change the terrain. So I'm actually pulling terrain up. If I hold down control and right click, I can push things back down. So if I want to reshape terrain, I can do it in this way. Now there's other tools as well. For instance, I could go to smooth and hold down control and left click and I can smooth out my results. So if you want to make a different version of this map with different terrain, this is one way that you could do it. Now let's get out of terrain editing mode and let's take a look at texture alignment mode. Texture alignment mode allows you to move the textures across a BSP surface in an intuitive manner rather than having to click on buttons or punch in numbers. So it turns out this little walkway up here is a BSP surface. So here I am inside texture alignment mode. Now I'm going to jump over to camera mode just to show you the difference. As soon as I go into texture alignment mode, we get this little transformation widget available right here. This allows me to move the texture that is on this BSP surface. So notice as I move it in Y, it slides this way. As I move it in X, it slides this way. I can tap the space bar and go into the rotation widget, and I can rotate this texture around, so we could push it all the way to somewhere around 45 degrees if we were so inclined. We can also scale it to make the texture larger or smaller. So I have to really slide my mouse pretty far, but now you can see those checkers are a lot smaller. So it's just a way that you can intuitively adjust a texture right here in your viewport without having to worry about going into your surface properties and clicking on some buttons. Now next we have mesh paint mode. When you enter this mode you're gonna get a nice little window that allows you to change a variety of, se of settings for controlling what color you're gonna be painting, uh, the radius of your brush, the strength of your brush, and so on and so forth. However, demonstrating this would require that I did some setup on the back end. In order to see the results of a mesh paint, you have to have a material which has a vertex color operator inside of it. Now, currently none of these meshes do, so demonstrating it here is not going to work out for us. Now, next to this, we have static mesh mode. This is kind of a way to help you scatter static meshes across the surface of your level. Now, to give it a real quick demo, I'm going to open up the content browser, and we're going to search for rock, and let's click on static meshes, and if we take a look, here is our, here's a little S underscore UN rock underscore uh, SM black spire 05C. So I'm going to select that. We'll close out the content browser. Now, while I'm in static mesh mode, I can place meshes on my map by holding down the S key and left clicking. And it's just going to place those. Now, I have some settings in here as well. I can give them a little bit of pre rotation and yaw, pitch, and roll. So we just punch in some numbers here, and it's just kind of like a, a predetermined rotation that will take place before the mesh is even placed. You also have a rotation min and rotation max, which allow you to kind of randomize rotation. So if we take our yaw and maybe set this to negative 30, and our max to positive 30. In fact, let's just do that for everybody. Or we could just set it to uh, 180 all the way down. So let's do negative 180 all the way down and then negative 180 here for our min, and then we'll do positive 180 all the way down here. So we could get any rotation. It, it could be a, a wide variety of different rotations. Now, as I hold down S, oh, didn't mean to do that. Let's make sure I don't punch that into my value here. Make sure you have focus over here in your viewport. As I hit S and click, I'm getting different rotations with each rock that I'm dropping. Now, if you were clicking and placing objects just on the ground all the time, that would be more than enough. You'd be good to go. However, if, let's say we just set all these back over to zero, just as an example. So now all of our rotations are just set to zero. Also, I'm going to grab a more, kind of a more directed static mesh. So let's maybe get away from uh, this kind of organic rock. Let's grab something like, uh, do we have a statue? 
Surely there's a statue in here someplace. Yeah, here we go. So we got this little guy, this kind of Atlas statue. So let's say we want to place him. Now, if I just hold down the S key and click, I can place this guy right on the ground, no problem. But what happens if I hold down S and click on the wall? It places him against the wall, which is okay. It kind of looks a little cool, almost like he's Spider-Man in this case. But what if I wanted him to really be kind of, you know, sticking out of the wall? I can hold down Alt and S, and I can click, and it'll orient that static mesh along with the surface normal. So Alt, S, and I can put these guys right along the wall. So that's just a quick look at static mesh mode. And that wraps up this quick kind of high-level discussion of the various modes that you can put the editor in. Now let's move on down the toolbox here on the left-hand side. Let's take a look at the primitives area. Now, the idea behind this area of buttons is that you're going to be changing the red builder brush into the shape of whatever these primitives happen to be. So if you just start left-clicking, for example, if I click on the cone button, you'll notice that the red builder brush converts into this kind of rudimentary cone-like shape. We click on cylinder, you can click on curved staircase, and you're just starting to change the shape of the red builder brush. Extremely straightforward. Now if you right click on any one of these, you get the settings for that particular primitive. For instance, if we right click on cube, we get some settings for its dimensions in X, Y, and Z. Its wall thickness, which is really only going to be effective if you switch on the hollow operation. This will give you a cube that is hollow on the inside, and then you can set the wall thickness to how thick the walls are. Pretty straightforward, and each one of these is going to have different settings. For example, if we jump over to a cylinder, we have the Z height, we have the inner radius and the outer radius, which, again, outer radius is going to be most useful if we switch on hollow. So again, all of these are going to be a bit different. Now, I'm not trying to chase you away from any of these operations, but generally speaking, in a best case scenario, you're really only going to be using cubes, occasionally a cylinder, and very, very occasionally a cone. Now, most of these other primitives, again, in a best case scenario, you wouldn't use as a brush. You'd actually bring in a static mesh. For instance, a tetrahedron, if we click on this, we get this sort of diamond-shaped thing. In fact, I'm going to hold down the L key and rotate around it so you can get an idea of what it looks like. But if we right-click on its settings, we can take the sphere extrapolation and start to increase that. So if we set that to, say, 4 and click Build, we get something that looks a lot like a sphere. However, this would be highly inefficient if we were to create it out of BSP geometry. So as a general rule of thumb, you don't ever want to do this. But if you're in a pinch and you do not have access to a 3D modeling application such as 3ds Max or Maya, then perhaps you'd have to take this route. And the same is true of the staircases. So if we click on a staircase, you'll see that we're starting to get kind of a nice curved staircase. If we right-click on its settings, we have some various things we can control here, the inner radius, the step height, the step width, the angle of the curve, the total number of steps. And by changing these values, we can get different types of staircases. But this is really not the way that you would optimally create stairs inside of your level. In a best case scenario, you would create your staircase inside of an exterior modeling package, again, like 3ds Max or Maya, and bring it in as a static mesh, not as a BSP brush. The textures are very hard to get positioned just right, and it's just not efficient in terms of the engine. But if you're in a pinch and you have to do it, this is where you can do it from. Now, a curved staircase is going to run all the way to the ground. You'll notice as the stairs get higher, they're all based at ground level. If we switch up to a spiral staircase, the stairs will keep wrapping over themselves, and they don't reach all the way to the ground. So as you change the settings, you could potentially make a spiral that just goes clear out into the distance. And players can run on these. They, they work just fine, but... Again, I would, uh, I would try to push you away from using these if you could avoid it. Now, at the very bottom, we have cards. And what this allows you to do is to create two kind of volumetric cards here. So, like, if you had kind of a foggy material on these, you could place these in the distance, and it would look kind of like fog. In older Unreal games, you could use these for things like chains and torch lights and all sorts of stuff like that. These days, that sort of thing is generally handled uh, through either static meshes or particle systems. And so the cards primitive is not something you'll probably find yourself using very often. But if you need it, it's here. So that is a quick look at the various types of primitives. Now, 
I haven't really talked about the next group yet, but just to make sure we're completely clear, really all these primitive buttons are doing is just changing the shape of the, the Red Builder brush. Then you would use your CSG operations, either through the next group of buttons we're going to talk about in the next video, or by coming up to the brush menu and choosing CSG, Add, Subtract, Intersect, or Deintersect, in order to kind of push that along. So that is a covering, there's a discussion of the Moving primitive on buttons down our toolbox. Our next group of buttons are our CSG operations. Now, I already gave a really thorough example of the CSG operations when we talked about the brush menu. So if you'd like to jump back to that video, you can. In short, though, these allow you to add geometry by creating an additive brush, carve geometry away by creating a subtractive brush, to intersect the red builder brush, or de-intersect it. So at a glance, if we click on the add button, we're going to create additive geometry, which if I demaximize the viewport and we take a look at this from the top view. So there's my red builder brush. Let's go ahead and get that out of the way. Now we can see that we have an additive brush here, which is allowing us to have this solid geometry. Now I'm going to take our red builder brush. Let's move it back over and I'll slide it up slightly. And now I'm going to click the subtract button. This creates a subtractive brush which we can also see here in the top and in the side viewport, and the result of which is that it carves away that solid geometry. We can also intersect or de-intersect the Red Builder brush. If I move it over here to the opposite side of our, uh, our additive brush, so you can see here in the side view how they're kind of sticking through each other. If I click intersect, you'll notice that we only get the result of where those two brushes were crossing into each other. If we switch back over to cube and click de-intersect, we get the result of where they were touching but not quite crossing into each other. So that is a really quick look at the various CSG operations. When you're building levels inside of Unreal Editor, you'll probably find that you're using really primarily the add operation and occasionally subtract to carve out holes in your additive geometry. And these are the two that you're going to find yourself relying on most heavily. So that'll wrap things up for this video. Let's move on down the toolbox. Now, the next two buttons I'm going to look at are the Add Special Brush button and the Add Volume button. Now, the options behind these buttons were both handled pretty thoroughly inside the video over the Brush menu. But let's just take a quick recap. The Add Special button will bring up the Add Special window. And really, the biggest important guy in here is the Solidity group. This allows you to change the solidity of additive brushes in your level. A solid brush is kind of like your basic brush. Any brush that you just create by clicking CSG Add is going to be a solid brush. It'll block players. It'll block projectiles. A semi-solid brush is very much like a solid brush in that it'll block players. It'll block projectiles but it also does not create any extra cuts, vertices, or edges inside your CSG, your constructive solid geometry, which is the geometry that is created because of your BSP brushes. And then finally, you have non-solid, which doesn't create cuts and is kind of like a holographic brush. You can walk right through it. You can shoot right through it. So let's go ahead and close that. Next, we have the Add Volume button. Now, if you left-click on this, it doesn't really do anything. If you right-click, it opens up a submenu, which is actually tra trailing all the way off the video capture space with all of the different types of volumes that you can create here inside UDK. And a volume, in short, is just an area of space that when the player passes into it, something happens. It could be uh, you change the physics so that maybe gravity is different. Maybe you inflict damage on the player when they pass into a volume. Maybe you stream in another level when they step into a volume. A lot of different uses. There are even light mass importance volumes, which take the light mass system and tell it where to focus its various radiosity calculations. So that is a quick look at our add special brush and add volume buttons, which will wrap up this our last section of buttons in the toolbox is the visibility section. Now, what I'm going to do is come up here to file and let's choose open and let's grab, oh, anybody will do. Let's grab DM Sanctuary. Give that a second to open and pow, here we are. Now, I'm going to fly over here. So it doesn't really matter who I have selected. This is just kind of as a demonstration. But if we select, say, this little static mesh. In fact, let's grab this guy, this kind of pillar static mesh. You see him selected blue here in the perspective viewport. We have four buttons over here. We have Show Selected Actors Only, Hide Selected Actors, Invert Selection, and Show All Actors. So their names pretty much tell what they do, but let's go ahead and click on them anyway. If we say Show Selected Actors Only, that's going to hide away all of the actors except this one actor. Now, you're probably still thinking, wait a minute, I still see all this other stuff. These are BSP 
uh, brush geometries. Basically, this is the CSG, the world geometry that has been built for our level. So we can't just make that disappear. If we want to make that disappear, we can hit the Q key and that will go away. So now we're just looking at this one object. Now, if I want, I can click show all actors and that'll bring all that back. But if I want to bring back my world geometry, I need to hit the Q key again. So there we go. We'll bring that back. Now, our next button is to hide selected actors. So if I need this pillar to go away for some reason, just click hide and it goes away. Very simple. So we'll click show all actors and bring that back. And then we can invert our selection. So if I have this pillar selected and I click invert selection, now everybody else is selected, which looks pretty complicated. And we could say hide selected actors and that makes everybody else disappear. So just a really quick look at the last four buttons of our toolbox. They just allow you to control visibility and really focus down on exactly what it is you want to see. Remember, if you are trying to hide away everything except a single actor and you still see your CSG, remember to use the Q key to make your world geometry go away. And that is going to wrap things up for this video. The console bar sits at the very bottom of your screen and it allows you access to some precision controls when working with your objects inside UDK. Now the first section allows you to punch in console commands, just various commands right here inside the editor. For a list of these commands, you can jump over to udn.epicgames.com slash three slash console commands. And here's a list of all of the ones for Unreal Engine 3 that you can try out. Now, some of these only work inside the game, and then others will work inside the editor. So feel free to play around with them. As you add more and more commands, this dropdown will fill with these commands, so you don't have to type a command twice. You can just click on it and use it. Now, as we move along the console bar, we get a couple of informational fields. So for starters, if I select a static mesh here in my level, you'll notice that it's actually telling me that I have selected static mesh actor underscore 565 located right down here in the bottom of the console bar. Now it also tells me that I'm in the persistent level. Now that's really only relevant information if you're doing level streaming. If you're not streaming levels, it's always going to say persistent level. Now if I hold down control and click another static mesh, we get two static mesh actors selected and every static mesh that I select will increment that. As soon as I select something that's not a static mesh though, so still holding control, if I click on this little path node, it just switches over and says four actors selected. So it's just some feedback on what it is you have selected. Now, if you manipulate objects, so for instance, as I start to slide this object around, you will get some numeric feedback as to how far you've moved that object in any given axis. So as I slide it up, you can see there's a number down there changing, but because I'm not using a widescreen monitor right now, that number is kind of hidden by the name. So if you have a widescreen setup, that uh, number becomes a lot easier to see. Now, moving on from here, we have the draw scale fields. These allow us to control the size of any given object here inside of UDK. Most useful for static meshes. You can take a static mesh and change its size and completely change what that static mesh could be used for. I mean, you could take even just a little tiny steel eye beam and you know, maybe something is only about three feet long. You can stretch it out and then make it just look like something that would actually hold up a building. So in this case, so here I'm looking at this pillar on the corner of this kind of chapel-like structure. We have a static mesh that's already been scaled up. Now, these fields work as follows. The first field is just your general draw scale. That's going to work in X, Y, and Z uniformly. So currently, this mesh has been set to three times its base scale in X, Y, and Z. If we set this back to one, you'll see that our little mesh gets kind of tiny down here. So let's go ahead and push that all the way back up to three, and he gets to three times his original size. Now, the next three fields are your X, Y, and Z fields. Now, all four of these fields, being your uniform and your X, Y, and Z fields, all work independently of one another. So you can set the overall scale up to three, and then in this case, we've gone in the Y and Z axes, our last two fields, and we scale down slightly. But for instance, we could take the Z scale and punch that up to two, and we've just made this pillar a lot taller. So just by changing these numbers, you can really stretch things out or shrink them down. You have a lot of control over the size of your static meshes just by using these fields. It's a more precise way to scale objects than using your scale widget right inside the viewport. Now, as we move on down the console bar, the last few things we have are the various snap settings. So the first one is our drag grid. We can toggle the drag grid on and off by using a little checkbox here. Now, if I come over here to the top viewport, and let's pick on, oh, let's see. Actually, I'm already moving that static mesh, so we could just do that. In fact, just to make things nice and clear, I'm going to click on the 
uh, show selected actors only button. And then if I click on the static mesh, right now I'm moving it in increments of 16 units because that's what my drag grid is set to. I can change this value using the drop down so we could crank it all the way up to 128. And now we're snapping in 128 unit increments. Or if I don't want to snap at all, I can just turn that off. Now, generally speaking, you don't want to do that. It's a good idea to always leave your drag grid on so that you can keep objects snapped right up against one another. This is especially important when placing BSP brushes, as you'll generally want those to, uh, especially additive brushes, you'll want them to butt right up against one another and not do much by way of overlap. Now, let's go ahead and switch that back on. As we continue on down the console bar, we now have rotation snapping. This is our rotation grid. Uh, the little drop down allows us to control the degree of snapping. So uh, the little uh, squiggly marks basically tell you you're getting about three degrees. There's a little bit of play in there. You can also snap to 45 and 90 degrees as well. And if you don't want your rotations to snap, you can of course use the checkbox. Same thing with scale. The checkbox controls whether or not there is any scale snapping and the drop down allows you to control the degree of that snap. Finally, at the very end, you have your autosave feature. If you switch this on, you are autosaving every X amount of minutes, and there's a drop down next to it that allows you to control the increment of the save. So that's everything there is for the console bar. Again, it's a very straightforward window, allowing you to get some precision feedback on objects, as well as some precision control over their scale and whether or not you're using any snapping. And that will wrap okay, up. Okay, it's time to talk about one of my very favorite parts of the UDK interface, the content browser. Now, I'm going to open the content browser by clicking on its button located here inside the toolbar labeled Open the Content Browser. You can also go under View, down under Browser Windows, and choose Content Browser, whichever way works for you. Now, when you open this, it may seem a little bit intimidating if you've never looked at it before. There are a lot of buttons, a lot of icons, a lot of check boxes, things you can type in, but don't worry. Once you get the hang of what each of these basic areas do, not only will you find that the content browser is very easy to use, but you'll find there's a lot of different ways that you can use it. And you can kind of tailor your own workflow to exactly how you want to make use of this. But first, what is the content browser? Well, this is where you're going to go to find any exterior assets that you want to place in your level. And by exterior assets, I mean things like textures or static meshes or like 3D models, basically. Any skeletal meshes, any particle systems. Anything that was created either through some external source like Photoshop or 3ds Max or Maya, or objects that were created with some of UDK's internal editing systems. Basically, any object that is not already coded into the engine itself is all available right here inside your content browser as an asset. Now, again, if it looks a little bit complicated at first, really it's just until you start to understand what each one of these panels are. So let's just break it down into some simple terms. Here on the left-hand side, we have the source panel. This allows us to control where it is we're looking for assets. Just keep that in mind. The left-hand side is really all about where we're looking. Here in the center, we have the filter panel. This allows us to control what it is we're looking for. We can type in a specific name of something, or we can just click on a checkbox to search for an object type. So we have what we're looking for, and on the left, we have where we're looking. On the right-hand side, we have our tags panel. This allows us to take any asset and apply a tag to it. So for instance, we could have a tag for any building pieces that we use, things like brick walls and stairs and things like that. So that at any point, we can search by tag and tell the content browser to say, hey, show me everything that could be used for buildings. And it'll pop up because of the tags. We can create our own tags. We can add tags to assets. We can remove them. It's kind of like having your own little label gun. And you can just click labels all over everything. Any object can have as many tags as you like. And we'll talk more about that a little later. Now here in dead center, we have kind of our results panel. This shows us all of the different assets that can be seen based on the filter, which is what we're searching for, and the source, which is where we're looking. It'll just show us all of the different icons for the assets that we have available. Now, right now, I'm not searching for anything. And if you click on the All Assets button, this is really just a great big, huge list of all of the different assets to which we have access. And it just goes on and on and on. But right here at the bottom, we can control how these assets are shown to us here inside the result panel. So I do want to go over this real quick. Now, because this is at the bottom of my screen, it's a little hard to see the tooltip for it. So what I'm going to do is kind of shrink down the content browser just a little bit and slide it up here into the air. And I guess I'll just stretch it out sideways a little bit. In fact, 
you'll notice on the left and right hand sides of the content browser, you have these little tiny white arrows. These allow you to collapse the tag panel and the source panel to get those completely out of your way. So let's just take a look at this bar underneath our results area where we can switch to different types of views. Now, by default, we have our thumbnails view. So if I give this a little bit more room, this is the default setting. We can switch this to a horizontal split view where we have a list at the top, so an actual list of assets, and then the icons at the bottom. We can do a horizontal split view where we have a list on the left and our icons on the right. We can just do a list view. So if you just want to see a list, personally, I like the icons. It makes me happy. So you just have some hybrid views. You can have a list. You can split the view horizontally, vertically, or just have your icons. This is probably my favorite. Maybe I'm just kind of a visual person. That's how it works. Now, we can control the scale of these icons. You have a little scale bar here. You can click and drag this. And as we drag right, we imp increase the scale. As we drag left, we decrease the scale. Pretty cut and dry how that works. If you zoom in too far and you're like, wow, I need to really zoom back, you can just click reset and that'll set everything back to 100%. Now, you can change your thumbnail size. By default, this is set to 128, but you can crank it up to 256. You can crank it up to 2048 if you like. And you have some huge icons, which won't even fit in our screen. But we'll set that back down to 128. And you can sort by name, you can sort by type, tags, path, even by their date added, and choose whether you want to see an ascending or descending result. So it's a great way for you to be able to control what it is you see here inside your result panel. Now, granted, what, in most cases, you'll find yourself just setting this area down here at the bottom once, and then you'll just kind of leave it like that forever. So I wanted to go ahead and get that part out of the way. Now, the other panels, being your source panel, your filter panel, and your tag panel, really all kind of warrant some individual discussion. So uh, we will be talking about those a little separately. However, before we end off this video, I do want to take a second and just give you kind of a general workflow as to how you can start using the content browser without having to know what everything is. Again, all you have to do is keep in mind what these panels are for. The filter panel controls what you're looking for. So let's decide that we want to put in some static meshes. As a matter of fact, I'm going to close the content browser and let's open up a level. Let's go to file, open, and let's grab VCTF Sandstorm. And let's just bring the camera down here close to the ground. It doesn't even really matter where, just maybe this kind of level surface over here so we can play around for just a little bit. I'll maximize my viewport and then let's reopen the content browser. Now let's say I want to drop some static meshes in here. So the first place my eye should go is to the filter panel where I can say, hey, look, I want to search for static meshes. So we'll go ahead and check that. Now what kind of static meshes do I want? Well, let's, as I mentioned earlier, we could be searching for building parts. So let's just type in building. And here's a list of anything that may include the word building in its name, path, tags, or type. And we get some objects here. So let's grab S. LT Buildings SM Bunker Sup A2, which is a really complex name. I'm just going to select it right here. Now we have a couple of different ways we could place this in the level. With it selected, we could do it the hard way or the easy way. We could close out the content browser with that object selected. And I'll show you the hard way first so that you'll understand how cool the easy way is. I'm going to right click here on the ground. We're going to come down to Add Actor. Now I have to load that static mesh into memory. So we're going to say load static mesh, and then there's the great big name of the static mesh. As soon as I do that, we get another submenu with add actor. And now we can go all the way to the top and add this as a static mesh. That was great. We only had to click, what, like 17 times to make that happen. But it works, and it's kind of the, the older-fashioned method for placing objects into your level. If you've been using Unreal Editor for a while, you're probably at least semi-used to that workflow. But there is an easier way. So let's open up the content browser again. I'm going to go ahead and restore it down to something fairly small, and I'm going to slide it kind of off the screen. Now, if you have a dual monitor set up, it's very cool to take your content browser and just fill up a second monitor with it. But check this out. You can see that static mesh here over inside the content browser. I'm just going to drag and drop. Boom. And I can play static meshes right here inside my, my level just by dragging and dropping. Very, very quick and easy. It's a great way to work. And this doesn't just work for static meshes. Particle systems, materials, they can all be dragged and dropped right out of the content browser. And all we did is we started off by saying, all right, well, I want static meshes and I want building parts, found what I wanted, and just dragged it in. That's a really easy way to work. 
Now, as we move forward through these videos and you learn about these different panels of the content browser, you may come up with different ways to use the content browser that kind of appeal to your specific workflow. But for now, let's go ahead and end the video here, and then we'll take a closer look at each one of these panels. All right, moving on with the content browser. Now, here on the left-hand side of the content browser, we have the source panel. This allows us to control where it is we're looking for a particular asset. Are we looking inside of a certain package, inside of a group within a package? Are we looking inside of a custom collection that we've put together? It also gives us access to the ability to create new packages and import assets into the content browser so that we can uh, create our own objects. Now, starting at the very top, we have the All Assets button. Really, this is kind of like a reset button for the source panel. So if I've already positioned myself inside of a particular package, if I click All Assets, that jumps me all the way back out to the top level with all of the assets available within UDK. Very, very straightforward. Moving down from here, we have two collection sections. We have Shared Collections, and we have my collections. Now, shared co collections can potentially be shared between uh, your entire team, and my collections are kind of like a uh, private group of collections for only your particular workstation. Now, there are some of these that are already included within UDK, and you can check them out. We have like cool ambient sounds, uh, building meshes, unreferenced assets, and really you can just click through any of these and just see what's inside them. Now, creating your own collection is very, very easy. Let's say, for instance, I'm just going to start off here and click on all assets. And right here, we have these cool textures, which allow us to see the different types of maps that we can play. Let's say I just want to put these in a collection for some reason. I'm going to come over here to my collections, and you could do this in, in shared as well. They work exactly the same. But I'm going to click on create a private collection. And let's give this a name. Let's call this screen images and click OK. And there we go, we have a collection, currently has nothing in it. If we select it, boom, it's totally blank. Now let's click on all assets again. And what I'm gonna do is select this first texture 2D for deathmatch. And right here next to my collection, there's this little tiny plus button. If I click on that, it adds that to my screen images collection. Very, very easy. If I wanna make multiple selections, I can click on one, hold down shift, and click down here at the bottom and that selects everything in between. And we can add those as well. So now eight things have been added for a total of nine, which we can see here. And if I jump back out here, maybe into a specific package, and I'm looking at stuff, at any point I can go into that collection, and I can see these objects. Now this is not, this is not basic. This is not like a duplication. Uh, it's not like we have an entirely separate copy of these assets here inside your collection. It's just a referencing system. It's a way that you can take groups of assets that you like and put references to them, kind of like pointers inside your own little collection so that you can grab those assets at any given point. But you haven't moved the asset, you haven't made a copy of it in a new package or anything like that. Now you can remove from a collection as well. So if I come in here and I right click on one of these assets, from the little pop-up that appears we have remove from collection and that'll just drop that right back out. So let's go ahead and just remove everything. So hold on shift, select all these, right click, remove from collection, and then, let's say we're done with this collection, we're never going to use it again. So over here in My Collections, we have a little minus button. We can click there, destroy this collection, and it tells you it can't be undone. So let's go ahead and click the Destroy button, and it's gone. So we have no more collections. Now, these collections can be moved around, so we can kind of resize these. So if we need more room for any one of these panels, we can do that. We can also collapse them if you use the little triangle right next to the name. So if you just want a lot of room for packages and you're not going to be using collections, just go ahead and collapse them. Get them out of your way. Now the packages area allows you to click on a specific package. If you want to look down inside of it, you can also expand a package by clicking the triangle next to it and see any groups that may exist inside that package and you can jump directly into those groups if you so desire. So it's a way to kind of step through the hierarchy of assets. So you have folders, and then you have packages, and you have groups within those packages. And really, this is just a way to narrow down where you're looking for something. If you have a package selected inside this panel, you are only going to be able to locate assets within that package. If you want to look in everything, remember you need to jump all the way up to your All Assets button. Now moving down from here, we have the New button. This will create a new asset, so we click on New, and we get some interesting info we got to fill out. We can choose a package for this new asset, whatever it's going to be. So we can call this my new assets. And what group? I don't know. Let's say we're going to make 
uh, well, we have an anim set selected. So let's do anim sets. And what name? This will be my new anim set. Then, because, because I already typed in anim set, we don't have to change this, but any other type of object we want to create is going to be available right inside here. So, I mean, I could say, well, actually, I wanted to make a material, and then maybe I'd want to change the group name to materials. When I'm done, I can go ahead and click OK, and that will create a brand new package called My New Assets, a new group called Materials, and here's my very own material that I've just created. So now I could double click that, open up the material editor, and start working with it if I so desired. Now next to the new button, we have the import button. This will import a new asset. So if I click on this, this allows me to bring in uh, such things as textures, which you can see come in a variety of different formats. We can bring in sounds, like in WAV format. We can bring in 3D meshes, uh, say in the ASE format, or skeletal meshes. But a lot of different things that we can bring in and import. And as soon as we choose something, it's going to give us a, a very similar window where we can choose what package it's going to be in, what its name's going to be, etc. and so forth. So this is how you're going to bring in external objects for use later in your own packages. Then if you have a package that is saved outside of your default folder structure, such as not actually inside the UDK installation, you can open that by clicking the Open an External Package button right here at the bottom. And that's just going to allow you to search your hard drive for some other package that you may have loaded up somewhere else and start grabbing assets from that. So very, very straightforward. Now, that is a walkthrough of our source panel. Again, really, the only thing I really want you to remember, if you forget everything else I talked about, just remember, this allows you to narrow down where you're searching for an asset. So that's going to wrap up this video. All right, let's take a look at the filter panel. Now, the filter panel is located here in the center of the content browser up near the top. It's this kind of light grayish area. And this is kind of an advanced search engine. It allows you to type in a name of something that you're looking for and then to narrow that down by selecting an object type or any potential tags. But let's take just a moment and let's go over the different options. So starting at the upper left corner of the panel, you've got kind of a collapse button. This allows you to make the all the checkboxes disappear or reappear. If you just want to be able to type in a value and you don't want to mess with all these checkboxes, go ahead and hide them. It'll just mean you can see some more results. Now, moving to the right from here, we can control where we look for any string that's typed into the search line. So we can look inside the name of an object, inside the path, which will contain the package and group that that object is located in. We can look through the tags, so any tags that have been applied to this object. And we'll actually talk more about tags later on when we get to the tags panel. We can also search through the different types of objects. Now, next to this, we have match any or match all. Now, you may already be used to uh, options like this for a search engine, but let's just give a quick example. If we take a look just at some of the assets we have right here in front of us, we see bio rifle fire impact. It's a sound cue. It's got several things. So let's come up here to our search line, and I'm going to type bio rifle, and then let's also type impact as two separate words. Now, currently, I'm set to match any. So any assets that contain the word bio rifle or impact are going to be listed here. So there's actually several of them. Now, if I set that to match all, all we get are those assets that have both of those words being bio rifle and impact. So it's really kind of a way to narrow things down and you can determine which one is best for any given search that you're doing. Now, if you want to clear out anything you've typed, you've got a little tiny X button here inside the search line and that'll just make that go away or any changes that you've made to the entire uh, filter area can be wiped out by clicking the orange clear button. And once you click that, it'll go back to gray, and that just kind of resets your filter panel back to its defaults. Now, moving down to the next area, we have the status area. This allows us to say, all right, I only want to search through those objects that have had some sort of a tag applied or objects that are untagged. Now, I have used untagged when I want to go through and just, you know, systematically make sure that everything gets a tag. It's a really handy way to do that. But by default, this is set to both, which makes it, you know, real easy to search through everything, whether it's tagged or not. Next, you have loaded, unloaded, and both. The cool thing about the content browser is that you can search for assets that aren't even loaded into memory yet. That's because the content browser operates off its own internal database. Now, you may be completely new to UDK, but if you're not, if you've actually edited using an, a previous version of Unreal Editor, 
you might remember all the way back to the generic browser. And when you were using the generic browser, which was before we had anything as cool as the content browser, uh, you had to load a package into memory to be able to use the assets within it. And that's no longer the case. So that's one of the great things about the content browser is even unloaded assets are available to you. All you need to do is uh, make sure that loaded and unloaded are both visible. Now, if you just want to look through what's loaded into memory, you can set that up. Or if you just want to see unloaded only, then you can do that as well. But generally, I leave this set to both. Now, next to this, we have object types. It's pretty straightforward if you take a look at the list. These are all the different types of assets that we could potentially take a look at in here. And here's some of our favorites. We have now the favorites here, these are all defaults. I didn't set any of these up. We have things like sound cues, uh, static meshes, particle systems, materials. But there's more than just these things. There are actually 41 separate types by default. If we come over to the all types tab, you can see all these and things like archetypes, decal materials, fonts, etc., and so forth. There's a big scrollable list of them. If you want, you can take any one of these and move them over to a favorite. So if you really like decal materials, you can right click and add that to favorites. And now when you come over to favorites, there's decal materials. So you can at any point check that. So by all means, set this up to whatever your favorite objects happen to be. Now next to this, you'll have any applicable tags for the type of object you have selected. So if I switch all, here's all of the different tags that have been applied to the assets that it found. If I switch to particle systems, that list is going to update to only the tags available on particle systems. And I can narrow down even further. So now I can say just explosion particle systems, and there we go. So these are all of the particle systems that have had the explosion tag applied to them. Now, even beyond that, we have another list of tags within that. We could say element fire, and so here are all of the particle systems that have the explosion tag and the element fire tag. So it really narrows things down very quickly without having to type anything. So that's just a really quick and dirty look at the filter panel. Very easy way to quickly narrow down exactly what it is you're looking for so that you can place it in your level. And that will wrap up this video. Moving all the way over to the right-hand side of the content browser, we have the Tags panel. Now, the Tags panel allows us to manage the tags applied to assets here inside the content browser. So what is a tag? A tag is just a label. We can put as many tags as we want on any given asset, and they're here to help us more easily identify what an asset could be used for or perhaps where we've used it before. You can make up a tag for anything you like and put it on any asset. And that's what this panel is all about. It's adding tags to assets, removing tags, creating new tags, or getting rid of entire categories of tags. So let's just take a quick look at this. Now I'm going to click on the All Assets button to make sure that I've cleared out my filter by clicking on the Clear button in the upper corner. And let's just select this Texture 2D for the Deathmatch. Now when I select this, you'll notice in the Tags panel that this already has a tag applied. Being special, it's under the Material category. So if I scroll down here inside my list of various uh, tags, you can actually see the Material category and there's the special tag which has been applied to this object. But let's say I want to apply another tag for some reason. Maybe I also think that this would be a great texture to include in the miscellaneous category under effects. Well, all I need to do is come down under effects. There's the mis miscellaneous tag. I can click on the little plus button next to it, and now I've added another tag to it. But then I think, you know, I shouldn't have added that tag. That's not really going to help me. It's not particularly useful. So let's go ahead and remove that tag. Up here inside the Applied Tags area, I can click on the little red minus sign. It only turns red when you mouse over it. But when I click on that, that tag is no longer applied. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Now, let's say I want to apply a tag, but I only want to apply one of the tags available to materials. So if I come down here under Manage Tags and come to the filter, start to type in materials, and I only get it to matte, and it immediately narrows down to the material group and only those tags included within it. So that's very easy. But then I'm thinking, you know, special is a little vague. So maybe I should create my own tag set to apply to these textures. So let's take a look at that. Down in the lower right hand corner, we have the ability to create a new tag. In fact, if I reduce the size of the content browser a little bit, let's close out the material editor back here in the background. I can click on create tag and you'll notice it has its own little tooltip, create a new tag that can be applied to assets. So now that you've seen that, let's expand back out. I'm going to click Create Tag, and we get a window that asks for the group that we're going to place this in and the name. Now, the name can't be empty, so let's call this, let's say, Game Type Screens. 
because that makes sense. Now, under the groups, we can create our very own new group if we want, uh, or we could just pick on material, and this new, uh, new tag will actually appear here underneath the material category. But just for the fun of it, let's create our own. So we'll call this custom tags. Click create. Now, nothing appeared over here because our filter is still narrowed down to material. So if I clear out my filter, if we scroll down, here's custom tags, and here are game type screens. So what I can do is grab all these screen images, and then come over here to the game type screens and click plus. And there you go. Now they all have the game type screens tag applied to them. So now if I'm searching and I search for textures, we can scroll down and there's custom tags available here inside the filter section and here are my game type screen so I can really quickly narrow down right to those objects because I've applied a new tag so let's clear out the filter section and then at some point I decide you know what that tag was a really cool idea but I really don't want to use it anymore we can take this entire custom tag section come down to destroy tag click on that and let's just click on the game type screens tag so as I mouse over the little minus button it uh, turns red for us Click there, and we get a warning that this is uh, completely non-undoable, that this is for good. So let's click the Destroy button, and there we go. That's gone. So now if I select these objects, you'll notice that that tag is completely history. So by doing this, you've already seen how we can create our own tags, how we can apply them, how we can remove them, and you got to see how up inside the filter panel, those tags will appear and allow you to more easily search for a specific asset. So by all means, make use of this. You know, even if you notice that there are tags that you know maybe could be applied to certain assets that would make more sense to you, you know, go ahead and apply them. If you uh, see some tags that you think maybe would be better for you to have, create your own tags, apply them to assets. Use this as a way to help you more easily find those assets you want to place in your level. That is going to wrap things up for this video. Thanks a lot. Thank you.